Right. Apparently we're good to go. And uh, I'm on the speaker, so that's satisfactory at this time. Um, welcome to the Place Overview and Scrutiny uh, Committee this evening, 31st of January, just to, for the recording purposes at 7 p.m. And um, I'll introduce myself first of all as chair and I'm Councillor John Bowden that represents Eton and Castle in the Windsor area. Uh, I will go through all the formalities, but for the benefit of those individuals, which include the Youth Council that are here, um, we have a kind of instruction service, first of all. So, welcome to this meeting of the Place and Overview scru Scrutiny Panel on Tuesday the 31st of January 2023. My name is Councillor Bowden, and I will be chairing this meeting. This meeting is being held in person and via Zoom and streamed live to the public on YouTube. I must remind all attendees that participation in the meeting indicates consent to the audio and video being streamed live and acknowledgement that after the meeting, it will continue to be available in the public domain. Firstly, it would be useful if all panel members could introduce themselves so that the public are aware of who is in this meeting and the role they are undertaking. I will begin with myself again, Councillor John Bowden, Ethan and Castle, and then to invite the panel members, which for this occasion, I will go to the right-hand side first. Uh, good evening, Councillor Shamsul Shalim, Ethan and Castle Ward, and I'm a member of the panel. I'm Councillor Maureen Hunt, representing Hurley and the Walthams, and I'm a member of the panel. Councillor Sandra Luxton, Cheapside and Sunningdale, and I'm a member of this panel. Uh, Councillor Leah Walters, representing Bray Ward, a member of the panel. Councillor Greg Jones, representing Riverside Ward, and a member of the panel. Councillor Singh. Councillor Gertz Singh. Uh, represent St. Mary's Ward, which covers a uh, town centre in Maidenhead. Thank you. Um, Councillor Catherine Del Campo, representing First Platt Ward. Thank you. Councillor Mendy Bra, representing Bissam and Pukum. Councillor John Davy, representing Clue and Edward West. Right, there are several officers here now from my left. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everybody. It's Andrew Darren. I'm the Exec Director of Place Service. Uh, I'm Elise Strachan, Head of Neighbourhood Services for the Borough. And Yordridge, Community Safety Manager. Thank you. Uh, we do have normally two um, parish councillors, but I think we've got apologies for absence from them. Are there any apologies for absence at the moment? Uh, yes, Chair. So we have apologies from Councillor Reynolds, Councillor Del Campo substituting, and apologies from Councillor Taylor. And as you said, we have apologies from Parish Councillor Pat McDonald. Thank you. Um, next stage of this briefing. I request that meeting participants do not speak unless I specifically invite you to do so. Once I've invited you to speak, before you do so, please state your name and the capacity in which you are speaking, if appropriate. I will also ask officers to speak at appropriate times as requested. If any individual attempts to disrupt the meeting, I'm able to use my powers in the constitution to adjourn the meeting or have the individual removed. We will now start on agenda items. Do we have any apologies for absence? We've cleared that point, haven't we? Good. Um, now, I have decided as chairman, the order of events are to be slightly changed in so much it is from operational reasons that I feel it's proper that the Thames Valley Police deal with their presentation first of all, and I invite the Chief Constable to attend and have a word. Oh, sorry, I do have to clear this point. Sorry, carry on. So, does anybody have declarations of interest in the matters that are to be discussed from the Youth Council or Thames Valley Police? So, silence there. Please go. Yes, please go there, sir. OK, 
Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is John Campbell, Chief Counsel of Thames Valley Police. I'm also joined by Superintendent Claire Nibbs. Many of you, I think, already are, have met Claire, who's the new Superintendent and Local Policing Commander for Windsor and Mainhead, which is uh, fabulous news. Uh, and also John, DCR John Gronin. John was temporary Superintendent for Windsor and Mainhead. I know some of you will have met John previously as well. Um, I've got a presentation. I'm mindful, Chairman, that uh, the Commissioner's joined us. Uh, and I don't know whether or not Matthew wanted to kick off at all. Uh, and then Matthew often hands over to me then for the, the, the body of the presentation. Good evening, Matthew, Barbara. Um, I see you on the screen there. Um, you're obviously the police crime commissioner in the Thames Valley area. Um, I'll call upon you to make a briefing after the chief constable, and then we can uh, ask questions of yourself and the chief constable. Is that okay? Uh, that's absolutely fine. Thank you very much. Local policing area to the force, but uh, we have a number of local police areas. If you're unaware, we cover Buckinghamshire, Berkshire and Oxfordshire, um, a population of about 2.5 million people, uh, about 6 million visitors uh, a year. I think most of them come to Windsor. <laughs> I think if I, if I was looking at the rest of the, uh, the three counties um, and uh, quite a big force area. And we are about the sixth biggest force in the country, which gives us a little bit of scale uh, and a certain amount of demand. Thanks. Next slide, please. Just to share with you the, um, the team that are responsible for from across the force. So um, next to me uh, is Jason Hogg. Now, my time with Thames Valley Police is coming to an end at the end of March as, as I retire from policing. And Jason Hogg, who's the current Deputy Chief Constable, he's taking over as Chief Constable on April the 1st. He will be meeting next year, if not before. Um, a couple of things of note. So we've got Dennis Murray. So Dennis is the bottom second from left. Dennis joined us from Northamptonshire Police. Uh, he leads for us on crime and criminal justice. Uh, Tim DeMayer. Now, if you've been around in the local authority for a while, Tim DeMayer used to be your local police commander. Well, unfortunately, we're losing Tim because he's just been appointed as Chief Constable of Surrey Police, which is wonderful for Tim, not so great for TVP, but we wish him well. And he's leaving us around about April the 1st. Um, and then we've got a number of regional roles as well. So bottom right is Tim Metcalf. So we in the in Thames Valley Police are also responsible for the counter-terrorism unit for the South East and also for organised crime in the South East. And when I say responsible for it, it's preventing it, obviously. And, um, and uh, he has a regional role as well. OK, thank you. Next slide, please. So um, we're a force of around about 4,000... Uh, 800 police officers and that's the most we've had for some time and we certainly are benefiting from what you might have heard around the police uplift program 609 officers um, over the last three years have joined us which is wonderful we, we lost a certain amount of officers and police staff during the years of austerity doesn't quite take us back to where we were but certainly a very welcome addition uh, and we have 3,000 400 odd police staff and many of those are doing things like call handling or investigators or police uh, police crime scenes investigators. Um, I guess the one thing I, I would point out is that as welcome as those additional numbers are, uh, we have around about 4,900 odd police officers for 2.5 million people and that's a, that's a bit of an equation that can be sometimes tricky to to work our way through in terms of trying to have as many officers and staff as we might want to do the kind of service that you definitely would want and we would certainly want to deliver so it can it can make things sometimes um, a, a little tricky in terms of uh, some service provision we've got currently around about 280 police community support officers and that's the people that are actually working with us and it's not as much as we should have so we have lost a number of pcso's to police recruitment Many of them are staying in and around policing, so the Joint Thames Valley Police is part of that big uplift programme, the recruitment programme. The downside is that a number of wards across the force have lost their PCSOs, and PCSOs are, um, I'm sure I, uh, you, you know, are very valuable members of the kind of like the team, the community policing team. I use P and a small P because you'll have your own 
wardens and the like and staff and a very important part of the policing model that we have. We are recruiting going forward. Uh, there's a couple of things, I don't know if you're finding it in a local authority point of view, but certainly there's a buoyant jobs market, which is a starting point for making things tricky to recruit. And on top of that, as I say, at the moment, big recruitment for the police regulars, but it's not, it's not how it's meant to be. We want to recruit those as well as we can. If you do happen to know anybody that you think uh, would make a great PCSO, uh, then uh, please point them in the direction of, of policing, really, because uh, they do a fabulous job. 230-odd uh, special constables. Um, they're, they're really kind of superhero special constables, I think, because they, they have a normal job, you know, uh, Monday to Friday or whatever, and then they decide they want to do additional work at weekends quite often, quite often in nighttime economy or on patrol in their local communities on top of that. And so we've got around 230. We do want to increase that amount. Uh, we want to increase it because they're an important part of the infrastructure of the force. But with all the other training and recruitment that we've had to do, special constables have been a little bit on the back burner. But now we're coming to the end of our significant uplift of recruitment. We've still got about 600 people to recruit the coming, in the coming years. So it's big numbers. We want to increase special constables. And then, of course, we've got our wonderful volunteers who are members of the public that help us out. Uh, sometimes they work in admin jobs, helping the police do an administrative function, so allowing police officers to be out on the streets, which is great. Uh, quite often they help us out with our training, at our police training centre, which is in Sullumstead, so not too far from here. And they'll spend the day getting arrested, quite simply, and making lives difficult for training police officers. So again, if you know anybody that wants to be a volunteer and help us out with police training, there's some great opportunities to be part of that police family. Cadets, we have a wonderful cadre of cadets across the force area. Makes me feel very old because I used to be a police cadet many, many years ago. And then we have mini police, which are much younger primary school and junior school age of people, of young uh, children that uh, we work with as well. Thanks. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned about the police uplift programme, which is, which is uh, a wonderful boost to us all. Um, what I would say is that we've been able to use it as a, an important catalyst for increasing our Black, Asian, minority ethnic recruitment within the force which is really welcome. It's not enough, and we have more to do as a service, both locally and nationally. But of our recruits this year at our police training centre, 15% are from a Black, Asian, minority ethnic background. And that's, that's almost doubled where we've been over the last two, three years. And when you think of some of the terrible stories that, that maybe international stories, but about policing, and, and this week, the terrible stories that we saw in Memphis, you know, you know, people coming from different diverse backgrounds into policing, well, they have to trust us and they have to trust the organisation. We have a wonderful team of positive action engagement team officers who are from black and Asian minority ethnic backgrounds, who are part of our recruitment team. They're able to tell of the fabulous career you can have in the police, give some insight in what it's like to be from a, um, a diverse background in policing. And they've had some considerable success. And also, 42% uh, of my recruits are female officers as well. <laughs> and again, when you hear some of the things about courts in policing, um, uh, some, some definitely deserved in, in some parts of the country and some criticism, and we can all do better. Uh, hopefully that's a, a welcome increase in, in our operational footprint of, and the balance. In actual fact, 52% of my whole workforce in Thames Valley Police, police officers and police staff are female. Thank you. Next slide, please. So some of the figures we're going to, I'm just going to take you through now. So this is across the force. Now, I don't know, I don't know your experience as a council, but quite often in policing, we'll get focused on what we don't do rather than what we do do, you know, and you'll probably experience some of that as a council as well. So this is just to give you a sense. So this is over a six month period. It's up to September. We're doing it again for, for the end of March. So we will put this stuff out. We did put it out to the media in the autumn all these figures, not a single media uh, organisation took us up on publicising. So there you go, you get a sense of maybe how the media betray some aspects of public service. But um, um, contacts from the public are about 500,000. Now, some of those will be a 101. Now, 101 is tricky service for us at the moment. It has been for a while. We've had some peaks and troughs with it. Um, it's a non-emergency number, but we know there's important stuff in there. So there's, I guess I'm going to say it anyway, but there's little consolation in this is that lots of non-emergency numbers have, have worse contact times than we do. And in the past, 111 has been nine minutes and other private sector companies sometimes have far worse call handling. But we know it's really important because 
in those one-on-one calls will be people's crimes or their incidents. And it's something that we, we are looking to get better at. Matthew at the end, no doubt, will share some more information, but um, it's a, the 999 system is very robust. Eight seconds and you'll get a response. Uh, and then we'll be allocating officers uh, to the member of the public. The 101 at the moment is an average of about four minutes, some much better depending on the time of day, because as you'll know, not all the calls come in at a regular time around the clock. Wouldn't that be nice? And if they are peaked into certain times, we are trying to encourage online reporting. Uh, because it goes through to the same people, it's just managed better. But going forward, we're looking at a programme of work with our colleagues in Hampshire Police around how we can use technology, artificial intelligence, or that interaction so we can manage more calls and, and be much better at 101. Because we do recognise it's one of those things as an interface with the public that we need to do better at. Um, number of arrests, 15,000 in the six month period. Of those, 5,000 were for domestic abuse you know a big workload we have for domestic abuse and that should be a collective concern for us all because we think it's hardly the tip of the iceberg quite frankly so we never set ourselves reduction targets for domestic abuse because we want people to feel comfortable reporting it and we know it's still terribly unreported knife crime arrests big push for the force the force is one of the safest places in terms of serious crime in the country which is really really welcome but any knife crime and any work that we do uh, is is really important in both preventing young people particularly carrying knives uh, but also taking uh, positive action where we find them um, drug dealing and drug possession around about two and a 2,400 crimes recorded. And that's, when you see drug dealing recorded, that's us doing investigations. So it's us, us finding drug dealing and possession out on the streets. Uh, I have made these previously in other council meetings. There can be an image of a drug user, and there are some of an habitual drug user who then goes on to steal, to promote and feed their, you know, their habit. That's still an issue for us. But there is also a significant amount of people in our communities that use recreational drugs. You know, and, you know, the, even the term that we use as society recreational kind of minimises the impact of the impact of or the impact of those drugs on the system of drug dealing. The simple thing is it's market forces. And if we didn't have people buying drugs or using drugs, should I say, people wouldn't sell them. So there's just something I think collectively we could think about, about how we create that kind of atmosphere around people recognising if, they, if they're buying recreational drugs, after work or for use at the weekends with friends in a kind of a more benign environment that they may think is associated with drug use, they're part of the drugs county drug line problem. Um, confiscating of firearms has been a big priority for us, and we're actually down significantly uh, around about 40% on the amount of firearms discharges that we've had across the force area, and we've had some strong, uh, serious and organised crime arrests. And in a six month period, we arrested 250 odd people for involvement in exploiting children. And those are terribly high numbers, aren't they? And uh, so some of those will be people that are doing sharing indecent images off the internet. And we do a lot of work with our police online investigation team. And also these are people meeting people online, young people online quite a lot, and then trying to meet them for sexual purposes. And uh, again, uh, uh, big numbers, particularly around the, the sharing of indecent images that we work with the National Crime Agency. And each area will have their own workload uh, around that. Thank you, next slide. Um, violence against women and girls, obviously a big priority for us, and we know we work closely with you. Nighttime economy uh, is a really important in terms of preventing crimes against women and girls in, the, in that environment. We have seen a really welcome increase. Um, the rape outcomes has increased, but they're still low numbers. So in the last year, we will have had about 85 rape investigations go for the court. OK, which is, 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 is as it happens, it's, it, it compares favorably with some of the forces, but that's that's limited confidence or limited consolation, really, uh, because it's lower than we would want. Um, but we have seen a significant increase in sexual offense outcomes, stalking harassment and domestic abuse. Um, and that's a, uh, a welcome increase. So where it says outcomes or formal action, that's detections in old money. There's more you can take account of. Um, it's not all charges before a court, sometimes that's not appropriate, but we have had a big push on investigations and hopefully getting some form of justice, and particularly stalking and harassment. If you've ever had any dealings or any residents that might have been subject to stalking and harassment, it absolutely you know, pervades their every working 
you know, every minute of every day feeling they're being stalked. It's a terrible, terrible crime. So a lot of effort has gone into that. We've seen a significant amount of justice, hopefully, and some reassurance. Thanks. Next slide, please. Um, these probably are things that I haven't talked about before, uh, at events such as this, but they are a significant workload for us. So in the last six months or so, 4,000 odd road traffic accidents that we attend. Missing people, 3,300 of those, about half of those are young people, and you'll have children looked after children as well. That's a significant workload for us uh, in terms of finding missing people. We have a really good success rate of locating people. Some don't want to be found. We'll have the conversation and then share that they're safe and well with those that reported them missing. But the vast majority return home after whatever experiences they've had whilst they're missing. Um, big footprint for events and some... I'll come on to you know London Bridge and the uh, the operation that we had in in Windsor not so long ago, um, but a big workload for us in terms of policing protests and events around about 320. Mental health is a significant issue for us and dealing with some of the consequences of mental health. Now some of this isn't crime, but on occasion we can be the only available agency to deal with people suffering mental health. So that 810 in six months relates to people we've arrested. So we have a power under the Mental Health Act to arrest people if they are a threat to themselves, might do themselves harm, or they're a threat to others. Now, uh, years ago, they'd have come into the police station, they don't anymore, quite rightly so, they now go to mental health uh, care. But that can creak a little bit. And so that can be a, 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 a difficult time for us when we're dealing with people with mental health. We have actually got nurses on duty on our late shifts across the force that help us out. So we've now had to employ nurses with us uh, work with our NHS colleagues because they triage people at the scene rather than bring them into custody, which is fabulous. So they did great work. Uh, we've also, in a six month period, so you can double it up for the year, attend around about 800 deaths. It's a police term, call them sudden, because the, some of them are completely expected, but we attend and work with the families on the coronial process as well. Um, and I guess uh, John and Claire will have done this themselves, unfortunately. For every sudden death that we go to, there's also often a death message that you have to deliver. So we ask a lot of our young officers really to knock a, to walk up a, a you know a, a footpath and tell people the ter most terrible news they'll ever have. And unfortunately, the, the figure now for last year is 1,200 police officers assaulted last year. Um, it was 660 odd for the six months. It's about 1,200 for the year. And um, whilst we're acknowledging policing that. Um, you know, it is a violent occupation sometimes and, you know, officers will be assaulted directly or in terms of preventing harm. We should, I think, all collectively be outraged every time an emergency service worker, be it police, fire, ambulance gets assaulted. Thankfully, we get the full support of the courts, which is good. And we look after the officers uh, and we've not had too many serious assaults this year, uh, but about 1,200 or so. Thanks. Next slide, please. Uh, some other highlights that again aren't necessarily around performance and project vigilance. So this is our nighttime economy operation and that has been something that we have done locally on the local police area. So this is where we put plain clothes officers out into the nighttime economy. They're given additional training around behavioural um, conduct of those that might be predatory in the nighttime economy. So this is men targeting women. Um, and the important thing about this operation compared with some in the past is that we're targeting the offender and not giving sometimes unwelcome advice to women and girls about how to live their lives because they should be able to go about living their lives however they want and feel safe uh, in the in the nighttime economy and everywhere really uh, and this involves plain clothes officers working with uniform officers and when i say success has been you know we've had plenty of individuals stopped and arrested too many than we would want but now that is going on across the whole of the town uh, the thames valley area we have had operations in this area as well White ribbon. So I mention these because obviously there's an awful lot of talk about police cultures and there's been some really unwelcome, I say reporting, incidents where police officers, not necessarily in this force, but I've had to sack officers in the past. So I can't say any, there's no sense of complacency from Thames Valley for inappropriate behaviours and sometimes unlawful behaviours. And we're seeing a lot. We, we're under duty in the police, I don't know if you're aware of this, to publicise everybody that we deal with for misconduct. It's in the regulations. We have to tell we have to publicise it. Now, not every organisation has to do that. And I'm not saying um, it's, it's wrong that we do. I think it's absolutely right that we do. Um, but uh, it does feel a bit relentless at the moment. But we have recently received White Ribbon, accredited organisation, one of the first police forces to do that. And this is where they, they come and assess as to whether what our commitment is and our processes and our actions around 
uh, misogyny, harassment and sexual discrimination within the workplace. And they've given us that uh, accreditation, which is really welcome. Um, we are now one of the first police forces to be a menopause friendly workplace. And the reason I, I say that that's important is because as a workforce where 52% of my officers and staff are female, making sure that those officers and staff that might be going through some of the more extreme uh, symptoms of menopause are given the support they want and can be effective within the workplace and feel that they can uh, live their lives uh, you know, and, and are supported in that is really important. So we received an award for that. And also we recently received race equality trailblazer status, again, one of the first forces in the country. And this is again, an assessment of our commitment to in words and deeds around race equality. And so these, these aren't things that say, you know, we're, a, you know, we've got no, these issues, this is about an, a force of 8,000 people, hopefully showing a commitment to its staff and the public and getting some external observations about how we operate, which to some extent I hope is reassuring. It's reassuring to me, but it certainly doesn't mean that there's any complacency. A DBS, Disclosure of Borrowing Service, where we, we went, when I was in charge of this some years ago, we weren't in a great place. We weren't in a great place. It was taking too long for DBS checks. I don't know if you recall, but particularly the council, if you've got posts that require contact with children and the like, if we're slowing that down as part of your recruitment, your people will go elsewhere. It's similar for taxi drivers and the like. So we were very good. Uh, we're much better now. Um, and uh, we're much quicker and we're great outstanding. And also firearms licensing, again, uh, we get a pretty good uh, bill of health compared to some. Thank you. Next slide, please. Operation London Bridge. Now, I, I, I go to all the councils around about now across the force area, and quite often I'm trying to explain to them why on occasion I have to draw officers from Cherwell or from Milton Keynes to come and police events in other parts of the force. It feels a bit different explaining that to yourselves because Windsor, for all the obvious reasons, is, is a draw on the force resources because of Windsor and all the events, and we're very proud and always will be to police those. So, London Bridge, you're all actively involved with that. 10 days of mourning for Her Majesty, uh, with a, uh, an international aspect to that as well. And then on the final day of her final journey to the castle, we had 15 Thames Valley, 1500 Thames Valley police officers on duty, as well as 500 officers from mutual aid across the, uh, across the country. Uh, and hopefully along with the military and other colleagues, uh, not least the local authority who at the time, my goal commander, Tim DeMeo was working with Duncan, uh, your ex-chief exec, uh, and I think gave a really good account of all the agencies working really well together, something in sad circumstances we could collectively be proud of. So, okay, next slide then. I think I'm handing over. Yes, right. There you go, John. Uh, so I'm, I'm John Grudin. I was the uh, LPA commander for the last five months or so, and my next few slides, I'll just take you through some, some local crime statistics. Um, this is, and this is for the, the period, so from April to now, and the, the comparisons are with the same period in the last year. And top left, I do apologise, it's quite stat heavy. I do like stats, so this, try, I'll go slowly so you can keep with me. Top left-hand corner is our total crime. So that's 7,892 crimes on the LPA in the last nine months, and that's a 3% increase from the same period last year. Um, of significant note, and I think of worthy of mentioning, is that we have had a 28.5% increase in the number of uh, formal action taken as the outcomes that Mr. Campbell has described, and that is either your court disposals, which would make up most of those, which is obviously very good. Um, directly beneath that one is the violence with injury statistics. We've seen a 2% decrease overall in our, in our violence with injury crimes that are reported to us, but we have seen a 26.7% increase in those that have had formal action taken in them. Um, Skipping across a couple of slides, then to the bottom right in the section of fences. As Mr. Campbell said, we don't, again, similar to DA, we don't look at the, or encourage any reduction in these because we want people to report them because they are historically an underreported offence. Um, but we can see that we've had an increase, again, a quite significant increase of 67.6% .6 in terms of those sexual offences that have had a positive outcome. Um, and in terms of rape, the numbers are very small, but we have gone up in those numbers as well. And in the top middle, you've got your domestic abuse statistics. We have seen an increase, which in some ways is positive in, that, in terms of what is reported. And again, we've seen a significant increase in those positive outcomes for that, for that crime type. Just in terms of the, the total crimes, the biggest increase has been seen in vehicle crime. So we've seen an additional 261 crimes for that crime type. 
um, and that's a 39% increase, which is obviously significant. And the biggest drop has been in public order of 172 and in bicycle theft, bicycle thefts, which has gone down by 57, um, which is again, a, a decent drop, drop there. So next slide, please. The vehicle crime, this is just to give you some context as to overall, yes, it has gone up um, and we are, I'll talk a bit more about what we've done about that in a second. But this is to give some context set against the previous years and the totals that have been um, reported to us. So you can see on the far right, that's 858, which is this period, and compared to 695 last year, which gives you that 40% increase. But if we go back to pre-pandemic levels, we're looking at nearly 1,100 vehicle crimes on the LPA, um, which was dropping slightly into 1920. And then with the lockdowns and such, it was 2021 to, to much lower levels. And again, in 21, 22, and that's why we're starting to see that increase. But we, we, it's important that we tackle it now and keep it low. Um, we have a particular issue on the LPA in Windsor Town Centre with tourists who are yet to check into their hotels and parking along the river, going for a walk, leaving their bags in there, and their vehicles are being targeted by individuals. Over the last six to eight weeks, we have targeted that area in particular. Um, we've had our priority crime team working on, on that. And we have last week arrested and charged a 41-year-old male with a number of offences. Um, he has been recalled to prison until 2024, and the team are building together a much bigger case to put more offences to him whilst he's in, whilst he's in prison. Um, we do think that he is responsible for quite a significant proportion of those crimes in the town centre, um, and we hope that the stats will show that within the coming weeks, but we won't stop there and we'll keep monitoring that. And it's something that we raise regularly with the council um, in, our, in our meetings that we have. And, and Andy Aldridge obviously joins us every day for our daily management meeting that we hold in, every morning. Um, next slide, please. So this is just, to, and it won't surprise you what the priorities are, given the crime types that I've shown you on the previous page, but this is just to set out to you what our LPA priorities are. And, and the top one there is violence against women and girls. That incorporates stop vigilance on the nights on the economy, as, as Mr. Campbell has said, um, but it also brings in domestic abuse, stalking and harassment, rape and serious sexual assaults, which also have a, an additional focus from us and from our investigation teams on the LPA. And, and you'll see internal culture there, and that comes back to the White Ribbon organizational stuff that, that Mr. Campbell was talking about. It's really important that we have Windsor and Maiden as a safe place for people to work, both as officers and as staff. Um, second priority there is, is violence um, against the person. Again, links to, very much linked to the nighttime economy. Um, our our neighbour team are working with the council to review and refresh the nighttime economy strategy. And that will include, at the moment, that the footprint for the nighttime economy is very much Windsor. Um, but that review will look at whether or not Maiden needs a policing presence. And if so, we'll, we'll, we'll incorporate that into that review of whether we need to, to police Maiden as well, given the additional licenses that are coming up in, in, in Maidenhead Town Centre. Um, the third priority you'll see is uh, victim engagement satisfaction. Um, when I came to the LPA at the beginning of September, it's fair to say that, um, that many of, of you as councillors and also some of the residents in your wards uh, were concerned with how you're going to engage with the borough. Um, and I know that um, the officers of Mr. Campbell and Mr. Barber received several communications from people highlighting those concerns. Uh, and so as a result, my focus over these last five months has very much been on trying to improve that. Um, for those of you that registered, we'll see that TV alerts stopped for a while, but they have now come back. Um, they may not be back to exactly where they were previously, but that will come in time and the frequency and quality of those will improve. Um, we have set up and established a strategic leaders monthly meeting with the leader of the council, the lead for crime and social behavior and officers. Um, and that I would say is probably the most productive single change that, that's happened on the LPA in terms of engagement with the council and effective partnership working. It means that the LPA commander and the council leaders um, and councillors can have a frank, open and honest conversation about what it is that residents are telling them and, and where our priorities lie and, and where our resources are and how we can help and work together to try and combat them. You'll also see what we put in place a, um, the challenges, or Mr. Gavis, we've, we've outlined previously the challenges around our neighbourhood police, and particularly with the different entry routes and some of the backfilling that has to happen to cover their, their protected learning time. Um, and as a result, we've reviewed, or well, I've overseen a review and a refresh of our neighbourhood engagement plans. And that's to make sure that we do the most with the resources we have got, and we maximise the opportunities for engagement. Uh, and that's going to those events that will, will, will give us that, those, those biggest opportunities. So that's, that's what's happened across the, the LPA over the last five months. Um, and I'm sure that Claire will, will continue with that as we move forward. Next slide, please. 
And this last slide is just to give you a, an example of what, what can happen when we do work together. Opsexa is a, a, a nationwide um, campaign around knife crime. Um, and it was in Windsor and Maidenhead, or across country on, on the 11th to 18th of November. It was a very well publicized event on the LPA um, with um, launched by Councillor Cannon with Andy Aldridge as well and the PCC in Windsor to, to launch it. We have four knife amnesty bins across the borough and we had 118 knives recovered. To put that into context, there were only 134 knives recovered across the, the whole of Berkshire, including those. So we had, a, we had the significant bulk of those. We had community engagement stands around the LPA and we carried out six stop checks of habitual knife carriers in that week. There were three significant arrests. One was uh, for an aggravated burglary of a pub. At knife point, he was charged and remanded. And we also had uh, possession with intent to supply and fail to appear arrests, which also had knives on them when they were arrested. We conducted several safeguarding and engagement visits to, to, to known um, habitual knife carriers. So these are people that we have intelligence or information, they do carry knives and we'll visit them and say, we know you carry a knife. Explain to them the dangers as to what, what that might entail just by carrying that with them. And we've also conducted numerous knife inputs to schools across the LPA and literature, disseminated to parents, just highlighting to them again, the dangers that, that are there. And I just put this on there as an example of what we can achieve together when we work, um, work closely with the council. I think I'm adding back to you now, sir. Thank you. Just a couple more points from me um, before I hand to the commissioner. The um, so uh, speeding offences. I haven't touched on that as a slide. We got the most recent number. So we had the drink drive campaign before Christmas, and we had around 450 arrests for drink and drug driving across the force area, which is about up 25 percent on the same time last year. Um, just under half of that was for drug driving. That's when you're impaired. So we can now swab drivers and it gives indication and they have, in effect, blood tests back at the police station. Um, and of the 450 odd, 101 were young people under the age of uh, 25. So still all work to be done about that uh, as an offence. And additionally, uh, quite often the issue of how much speeding enforcement we do is raised by councils. We, uh, um, so far this year, we've issued around about 150 40,000 speeding tickets. Uh, and uh, when I say that, people, some of them go, well, that sounds a bit much. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those things. It depends on your view on speeding, really. Um, I get as many uh, saying do too much as too little. Quite often, if there's a local community need, then linking with you, please link in with the local LPA, and we can look at ways we can help and support that, mobile cameras and officers and staff uh, accordingly. Um, and... Uh, uh, and so that's a significant piece of work that goes on throughout the year. John mentioned about the, the current challenge around neighbour policing now. Neighbour policing is a really important strategic pillar of Thames Valley Police. And we have always maintained a separate neighbour policing teams on LPAs, local areas, with a command structure that's associated around that. Uh, John touched on it. Because of our increase in recruits, which is really welcome, but it's given us an operational challenge that those recruits under their training program have abstracted and protected learning as part of their training program, which means that they are removed from frontline policing more than we might want, but as necessary, if that makes sense. Now, they will be on the response teams. Yeah, the 24-7 response teams. And in order for us to maintain those response functions, that's the 999 calls. Um, and I'm sure you and I certainly would want to maintain that. That's people at the highest threat and need us quickly and effectively. We've had to use some of our neighbourhood officers to backfill on some of those teams. Now, they are still on the area. They haven't gone from the area. But it means that there's definitely, I think, been a reduction in some of the engagement they've been able to do. And if you combine that with the PCSO issue I mentioned about the recruitment, is it feels a little bit... Uh, tricky for neighbourhood policing. I just wanted to reassure you, it's something that Jason, the new chief, is doing, and the commissioner, no doubt, will want to share some views from himself about community policing. It is a priority of the force, and we will reboot this because it's such a fundamental part of how we police in the UK. It's going through a little bit of an, a resourcing issue at the moment, but it is a strategic, a strategic priority. A uh, final slide from me, Chairman, uh, and this is. So this is from our Ofsted, in effect. The, the, Her Majesty's Inspector at Constabulary, and they also do the Fire and Rescue Services. They inspect us, and they're coming back to us again next year or the end of, end of this year. And it's called a Peel Report. Uh, obviously, there's a link there to Sir Robert Peel and the history of policing. Police effectiveness, efficiency, and legitimacy. 
And I share this because on top of the things that they said we could do better, and there were things they said quite rightly that we could do better, and there's lots of very positive stuff they said about TVP. These are a couple of the lines that they reported back on us. And I think with all the stuff that's going on in policing, I just wanted to share this with you, which is that TVP has an ethically inclusive culture and staff are proud to work for us. Uh, TVP is good at treating people. And when I say people, I mean the community with fairly and with respect. Uh, that we work with diverse communities to understand what matters to them. And in terms of those powers that we have over our fellow citizens that can cause so much difficulty if we don't deal, it, deal with them well and with respect and with dignity, such as stop and search, and when we use force against people that we detain, they say that we use our powers fairly and respectfully and fairly and properly, which from a chief council point of view is very good to hear. We put a lot of work into this. And we, as I say, we're never complacent about this. And Claire and John will be monitoring this all very closely locally, but I just thought I'd just share that assessment from others who came in and saw us last year. So I'll, I'll pause there, Chairman, if the, the Commissioner may have a couple of things you may wish to say, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave it in your hands. Thank you very much, John. Um, Matthew, do you want to feed on now or give the councillors here the opportunity to put some quick questions? to the Chief Constable and then your overview probably for the future once the um, Chief Constable leaves this year and your, your forward planning for the, count, uh, for the TVP. Is that a better way to deal with it? I don't want individuals to kind of forget their, um, their role as opposed to mixing and muddling. Are you happy for that? We can take some questions now. Why don't I take, oh, <laughs> did you hear that, uh, Matthew? You're not voice on at the moment. Right, Matthew, um, if you can hear me, I'm gonna take some questions at the moment and see if we can uh, realign your question with the virtual. Do, does anybody here have questions directly for the, yeah? Sorry, right, I've got them. Um, Council. Um, last. By the train station going to the park, there was a knife found with handbags and all. And uh, one of our residents reported that. And it, this, this is the second time around it has happened because there are no lights over there, the lights are not very, it's not very late. So I just wondered if it's possible, because young children going from school four o'clock in the afternoon and all that. I just wonder if it's possible for somebody to look around or some sort of extra security, if it's possible to be doing at that sort of time, school time going home or late in the evening. Uh, Sunday. Just to reassure, when, when crimes are reported, into us, they will be obviously allocated to an officer. In addition to that, they will go into a crime pattern analysis. And every serious, I say serious crime, the vast bulk of crimes are then looked at on a 24 hour basis and reviewed by the local commander. We have what's called a daily management meeting, which looks at the last 24 crimes and also what are the resourcing issues for the coming day. So that can impact on patrol strategies as well. I noticed Council, you did say that the lighting wasn't very good. I don't, know if it's, I don't know if it's local authority lighting, whether it's private lighting. Right, so that might, I mean, it's, a, it's an observation to make that we obviously, if it is a lighting issue, it, it could be something so one that we night was with. found behind the big oak tree on the broom hall lane, and the other one was found just, yeah. just from the train station somewhere down there. Okay, thank you. So. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, officers. Um, unfortunately, uh, I heard of a resident on Saturday night who was um, mugged um, in, in Maidenhead. Fortunately, not with a particularly bad outcome, but um, the, I know the town centre manager also complains about aggressive shoplifters. And you would have thought that, that the best response would be to have far more foot patrols walking around the town centre, you know, a day and night, but you just don't see them. What can we do to improve on that? 
Um, we've talked about the nighttime economy strategy for Saturday night and, and that review of that strategy may end up with Footprint back in Aidenhead in time if it warrants it. Um, we, we would hold, well, Claire will now hold a, a tasking meeting every two weeks where all of the intelligence information is fed through from the crimes into that meeting and we, we then from that meeting decide where best our tasks to task our officers. So if that was a regular occurrence in Maidenhead, for example, and it crops up in our analysis, and that would become somewhere we would send officers to task at a particular time to make that worthwhile. So if that does become a prevalent issue within Maidenhead, then yes, that would end up with officers being tasked directly to that because of those incidents that have happened. I think there's a, there's a perception amongst the shops that they actually don't bother reporting anymore. So that then is falling, you know, not into your figures. Yeah. Yeah, no, I understand, I understand. And we, we have discussed this with, with officers of the council as well. And, and one of our neighbourhood sergeants is leading on that, on that engagement piece with this particular in Maidenhead. And we, we are aware of that, that issue and the concerns that have been raised by them. And there is a plan in place to try and reinvigorate that, that engagement plan with that team. So that, that's, that is, we, we are aware of it, yeah. I mean, that, definitely we can take that one away. It's interesting because over the last, over recent, we have seen about a 16% increase in shoplift. It's one of our bigger ones on our crime. Now, the crime things we talked about, we have, we have to be a bit careful. And I would urge you to, when we're talking to you, if you know, if, if we've got decreases or increases, you might want to ask, well, what are you, what are you comparing it with? You know, because comparing the offences, number of offences this time last year and the year before is a bit weird because of COVID. 1819 is the baseline that we're all collecting using, which is why John was showing you the vehicle crime system. Um, but we have seen a big increase in shop lifts. Now, whether or not that's linked to um, the economy, cost of living, it's definitely something we need to keep an eye on. There is always an encouragement for shopkeepers to think about their own security. Sometimes there is a bit of prevention people can do. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of visual, visible presence, of course. We, we do definitely get it. I've never, I, I mean, and we should be absolutely flattered. And here's, here's one maybe that I often reflect upon, is that in many parts of the world, people don't want to see more of their police. They want to see less. And yet, quite rightly, everyone wonderfully in England and Wales and the UK will see more, which we should be fired by. That said, one of the challenges that we have and Claire and John have is trying to balance the amount of officers that you have available to respond to calls, like the 999 calls in cars, and the amount of officers that you can deploy on foot. Because wonderfully, quite often those officers on foot aren't coming across crime all the time, because you might argue they're preventing it. So it can be a, a, a fine balance between the two kind of patrol strategies. But definitely, I'm sure John and Claire can take that away. And it sounds like there's some conversations with the local uh, town centre manager. But uh, thanks, Councillor. Could I just come in and make a point? We've, we've also just set up an assessment and investigative unit in Berkshire, which are largely office-based, but they can get hold of an investigation much quicker than an officer in person. Um, the CCTV can be live streamed straight into, into the office. So everything can be done much quicker. And that, and that team has taken on a vast majority of those sorts of investigations that you've talked about. So the, the implication is you may not see, visibly see an officer, but you have got an investigator, sometimes detective um, qualified, who are then looking at those and looking at the patterns of offending. So you'll probably may see less visibility, but you will probably get a better service. Quicker service. Um, that evening by some officers and um, which is which is obviously great news and they're going to review CCTV and, and that sort of thing so uh, you know hopefully we'll get to the bottom of it but um, you know that, uh, that sounds great what you're suggesting there. Thank you. Uh, Chief Constable, one thing you didn't mention during your expose which we've had a lot of trouble in the villages particularly in the past is travellers. Um, this year or this summer, it's declined considerably in the particular village in which I live, but it has been, as you know better than I do, pretty bad in the past. I won't tell you the actual instances, but I think we, a lot of them know them. But they do threaten, you know, very seriously people, buildings and everything else when they get on, you know, illegally onto these things. I just wonder, what, there has been a decrease though, I've noticed this year. Um, maybe it's peculiar to the village I live in. Yeah. Well, I mean, thank you. The um, the uh, obviously, I mean, I, I will say this that we we have uh, traveller encampments 
in the force area and we will have on occasion hundreds in a year just because of the size of the yeah. area that we do and a number of those whilst the local community often are you know do not welcome uh, the traveller community arriving in their communities um, we have also a number of those traveller uh, communities uh, barely raise an eyebrow when they're there there are others that definitely do cause some sometimes crime associated with them. As with any group of people, you get those that do commit crime and those yeah, that don't. Sure. There has been a change in legislation, Councillor. So we now have powers that came in pretty recently, which gives us more strength to take action against unauthorised encampments where there is significant disruption caused. Now, there's a bit of a moot point about what your definition yeah. of significant is. That's a... It's been left a little bit to the police to, to decide upon. And we have used those powers um, on a number of occasions. Now, so I mentioned about the way that we, we, we have uh, our response to unauthorised encampments and certainly growing issues of antisocial behaviour and criminality around um, sites. That um, <laughs> they are reviewed on a daily basis by the local commander who then dials into a force meeting and we are able then to tell what form of unauthorised encampments we have across the force area. Then we are able to assess, work with local authorities, what stage they are in terms of maybe that civil path to injunct or if there's any criminal offences committed. And if necessary, then resources from across the force can be used with our public order commanders to then enforce the law, the new laws and the old laws as well. One of, one of the things that is... Um, sometimes lost a little bit, is that the old legislation also had a provision for local authorities to review transit sites. What that allows the police to do, if a local authority has a transit site, i.e. a dedicated location yeah. where travellers, people from the travelling community can actually go, we have a power to remove anybody to those transit sites. Now, it won't probably come as a surprise to you that very few local authorities have ever been warm to the idea of having a transit site. You can count nationally on one hand, those that do. But it is something I would always urge to consider because in an instant, what that basically says is, you know, you're not committing an unlawful act and we are going to provide you the right kind of environment, partnership, and this is the location maybe of your choosing because you, your traveller lifestyle. But it certainly over the years, that is the one thing that would have made a massive difference to policing. And I say that collectively, local authorities, if local authorities did provide transit sites, it's not a popular thing with councils, in my experience. Um, and certainly that's not reflected in the figures. But we do have more powers and we are monitoring much more closely. And it's something that uh, was a priority for the Police and Crime Commissioner when he came into post a couple of years ago. And that may be what you're seeing in terms of that response, but we still do get a number of impacts. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, my um, question is on the street lighting service you done a year ago. Um, I'd like to know um, what was the outcome and how are you liaising with the council to solve any issues? I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> now, I, now, I don't know whether John or Claire will, but what I will say, and to any of the questions that we get, if we can't answer them now, we'll definitely get you a written response. So can you just remind us of what that... Was it the street yes, light survey? We've done the street light survey a year ago. Right. And I'd just like to know what was the outcome and how are you liaising with the council to solve any issues? We'll definitely get into that. I don't know whether any of the officers are able to give us visibility on it, if that rings a bell with anybody. Right. <laughs> well, we'll come back to your councillor and we'll, we'll, we'll dig into what we were doing. It sounds... I mean, one of the things that you can do... Do you remember I mentioned about the nighttime economy generally and the violence against women and girls? On our police website, there is a facility to people to upload or say where they feel safe or unsafe in a location. And we're using that data to actually inform our patrol strategies. Um, and that's quite a useful thing to do. That, that is a slight, it's a kind of a similar issue, isn't it? That kind of people feeling safe. But on that particular issue, we'll take that one away and have a look at it. So I'll receive my question, uh, answer in writing? Yeah, yeah you would. What, what, are we absolutely clear that we've got it written down what we need? Because I'd hate to go away and then ask you again for the question. And was that, that was the police doing the survey, not the local authority? It's a, it was a police um, street lighting survey. Have a name. No, okay, we'll come back to you. We'll do some digging. Yeah. Thanks. You've got youth council here this evening to talk to you about the street lights. Was it to do with that? Uh, no, it's something. Yeah, we'll have a look. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chief. Um, I've got an idea 
for the council, for the police, for the wardens. Um, we, the people want to see police on, on the ground, or they want to see a force on the ground. They want to see people with a responsibility for maintaining um, a nice environment for people to be living in. So I did, I did a bit of crunching, as you do, and um, currently I believe that the council um, collects the preset on behalf of the police to the tune of just short of £17 million pounds a year. So my head went, right, OK, we've, we've called our own wardens over the last few years, and we're down to six now. And we keep talking about partnerships and wanting to work together and all the rest of it. And I know essentially the numbers for Windsor are similar to, to that sort of number. So it's not a lot of people to do things with on a neighborhood level. So if we collect the preset, the police preset, and then the police gave us some of that back, so it's ring fenced only for police activities. And if that was three million pounds, that would equate essentially to 60 new wardens stroke PCSOs um, and the back office staff to, to manage the proceedings. That would provide a very safe, a very safe feeling environment for the community. And I totally get what you're saying about technology and people can look down a thing and work out stuff and check a face and go, well, we've got a 27.8 chance of catching in on the then for whatever and go forget it. It's not worth our resource. But people want to see people, especially old people, want to see real people on the ground doing a job, talking to the neighbourhoods, finding out what's going on with those little nuances. So I give you that to sort out in the next two months or pass it on to Jason. Okay. I guess, I mean, fully agree with the principle, you know, that, you know, how can we maximise that visible presence combined on the streets of Windsor Maine and that sense of reassurance, someone in control. Um, on, the, on the general point about that 17 million versus 3 million, of course, the 17 million does go into the local police officers that do police. And of course, some of them are visible, but some of them are doing online investigations of child abuse or domestic abuse or detectives. So there is a there is a kind of system of policing that we have to maintain counter-terrorism, uh, armed police officers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on, which isn't quite as simple as we have to get a chunk of the money and just make it visible, uniform. Because many of the offences that you deal with and investigations um, go on behind closed doors. Um, and so we, it's for me, it's not quite as. I know you're, you're making a general point, as I get that. It's not quite sort of just taking that chunk of money to reinvest it in visible policing, and also some of the precept goes into the uh, the increase in precept in terms of running any organisation. Uh, and Thames Valley Police is about five hundred million pounds worth of organisation goes into things like this is the stuff that drives goes a bit cold, isn't it? Software and licences and all the stuff that you as a council will do you know and transport and fleet and all that kind of stuff so i absolutely fully take the point i think you know we'll always look for opportunities where we can work with the local authority and we've had great relationships in the past with the local authority and i've no doubt that will continue to maximize that visibility and if we can have a mixed economy of neighborhood teams and you know matthew and jason's ambition for neighborhood policing and community policing is definitely part of that strategy then we would welcome opportunities around that i can't say it's as simple as just turning that no, three million into yeah, people yeah. but i absolutely get your point Yes. Thank you. Take um, just a quick note. We were asked beforehand about photographs. If you could just, well, if you could deal with it. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, you mentioned in the presentation that uh, the 101 service is uh, under quite heavy demand at the moment. Is that correct? Um, I had calls to use it recently and I, I found it yeah it did take a long time to get through it's about half an hour I think and and it struck me that some of the issues are perhaps similar to what we have in the NHS with you know sort of getting people to the right place if you know what I mean so you know we know that 999 is for emergencies uh 101 is for non-emergencies but then you know the recorded message says uh if your call's not urgent please hang up and go online which I think is a little bit confusing because you know you've already called the non-emergency number um I did ask a police officer about this recently and you know the best advice he gave was um you know go go online and you know if you can't find the exact category for the thing you're looking for you know find the best fit and whoever receives it will forward it to the right place which which seemed like you know helpful advice um I just wonder whether um 
you know, maybe a little bit of communication work around, you know, how to use those resources might be helpful um, to get people to the right place first time, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And I, I wouldn't disagree. I, I mean, so one one. So average is four minutes. I, I've been looking at it over the last week because the commissioner pushes me quite rightly hard on this because it's one of those very obvious engagement opportunities that we that we need to do. And on one day, the average was 50 seconds on one day. On another, it was... One minute twenty, and then depending on your experience, your experience sounds a long time, doesn't it? Half an hour to wait on. Them. So I, I do absolutely get that and understand that. Um, we do have this thing. You're quite right. This this message, uh, and we all kind of die a little bit, don't we, about recording messages? How long does it takes when we phone agencies and and, uh, and suppliers? Um, that the whole point of that is that there could be a bit of a wait. But your, your kind of thing that you want to share with us might be suitable online. It does go through to the same system. Mm -hmm. Moving forward, and we, and we have allocated money, uh, the Commissioner's allocated money in the budget for us for this year, this coming year. Um, he's looking at how we can make it more interactive and more effective, because there are those people that do want to speak to us online, but there's definitely people that want to speak to us face to face. Um, and so we do try and divert people to online and then deal with that as effectively as we can. I don't think it's right. We're not getting it right at the moment it, for some people. For others, people, I also get lots of reports from people that say they have called us and it's worked pretty well. But of course, it's the negative ones that we get more visibility on. So um, well, points absolutely well made. We collectively know it's not working perfectly. I mean, I, it's not a race to the bottom, is it? There are... The one particular force is a 23 minute average and we're four minutes. So I say it's not a race to the bottom and I say no <laughs> gratification from those players, but ours is worse, less than that, but it's because it still stands a long time. But there is a program of work for the coming year that the commissioner will hold uh, the new chief to account for. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John, for that presentation. Um, <coughs> Very useful. Um, so, one of the things that um, stood out to me from that presentation is the vast number of residents that we have in across the Thames Valley region, not Shah BWM, yeah, two and a half million, and only four and a, four, just about 4,800 officers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, officer numbers are comparatively very low, um, you know, compared to how many residents you, you, you please. So, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's a task huge task now um just looking at the figures there um you know amongst that i, I did two two stood out to me quite clearly um the the stalking and harassment which was up 55 percent and uh, the vehicle crime which is up 39 percent and i just wanted to ask that um is is there uh, a, any particular pattern or reason um, as to why the stalking and harassment has gone up uh, and is this anything to do with um, on online um, harassment you know for, for, whether via email or, or, or whatnot that, that that's that's one question and and the other one regarding the vehicle crime now we had a huge problem in the maiden town center uh, regarding uh, theft and bike theft and petty theft um, you know we in the supermarket we had to employ meat monitors you know to, to police and one of my concerns is with the cost of living crisis and you know some of these the, 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 these petty criminals who have, who've, who've committed crimes have they progressed onto you know more serious crimes such as vehicle crime and 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 you know uh, you know what we're hearing about targeting our tourists that come into the borough now is is this a progression of of, of you know low level criminality which has um, increased over the, the you know past two three years thank you um, so, if we compare ourselves, if you, if you were to combine all that kind of acquisitive crime, we call it acquisitive crime, it's the burglaries, the robberies, the big, where people are taking property from people. So compared to where we were in 2018-2019, as a force, we're actually down 21% collectively compared to where three years ago. Now, so that's, a, that's encouraging, there's still too many, but that's an encouraging reduction generally. So burglaries, for example, different lifestyles, people are working from home, less opportunity. I think a really positive and welcome reduction in personal robbery, we have seen a reduction in that, and that's really good. A lot of stop and search, the deterrent stuff we're working, I think it's having an impact on that. Um, in terms of stalking and harassment, within that stalk, stalking will be a, harassment can be online. Um, and I think in terms of that increase, I, th I think that, again, it's an area that we monitor closely in terms of 
reduction targets because we're not there yet. So some of this will be people just living in their lives that don't deserve to live their lives in the way that a perpetrator is treating them. So the six, the, the increase, or what we would say that is, is welcome, is in the detections and the, the the outcomes for that. So that's the that's the increase. So. And I think as well, there has been more visibility. I think if we deal with victims well, and we work with third party agencies, they start talking about the police being better. So for example, when we, when we survey our domestic abuse victims, however horrible that crime is, and even sometimes with domestic abuse victims, the actual criminal justice outcome might be actually not what they want, but it's best for them, if that makes sense. Sometimes we have to take that professional judgment. We, we 85 percent of our domestic abuse victims give us high rates of satisfaction so in around the harassment definitely a welcome increase in our response to that and focus on that because for many crimes it's a precursor to more serious offending particularly around domestic abuse and other things um the theft of motor vehicle theft from motor vehicles interest because we have seen an increase um so we've seen an increase generally it's down on 2018-19 but we have seen a spike and i i think anything where we have a cost of living crisis where things get tight what starts to happen in my experience is that people start well there's definitely people start maybe stealing some stuff but it often if you're stealing stuff from cars quite often you need to sell the stuff so people need to buy it and it's a bit of a system so that if things are a bit pricey for people and they want to bargain they might start, in the old days, it was buying from somebody in a pub, wasn't it? You'd buy something, you know, some stolen gear. You can see that link in. So it wouldn't surprise us collectively in policing with cost of living crisis, as it is, you know, heating, et cetera, that <coughs> crime will start to go around those kind of acquisitive crimes. Um, but yeah, so whether or not they're going from one crime to another, people often quite stick to certain types of crime that they get unfortunately good at, if that's the right term. Um, but we do monitor it very closely, as I say, Shoplifting, sixteen percent up. That's a big hike. Yeah. That's a big hike. Okay, thank you. And um, and also, so just moving on to obviously, um, and, and officers have touched on the the nighttime economy, Maidenhead. I mean, we've been asking for officers um, for a number of years. Uh, I, I I I was sent um, numerous um, emails and, and, and videos and of 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 crimes committed, which I obviously I forwarded on um, you know, a serious violent um, activity that was going on in Maidenhead town centre over the Christmas period. Um, there was no police um, around at these times. We really desperately need um, police in the nighttime economy. And as it used to be, I mean, you know, in the old days, we used to have, you know, police on horseback and, um, you know, the right vans and all sorts. And, and now you don't have a single officer in, you know, patrolling in town or town centre. Although obviously we do have police around. Um, that would be important. There's also a concern amongst residents. There's a new car park which has opened up on Stafferton Way, um, and 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 the access to that by foot um, is what well, one is through a small tunnel which is very dimly lit, and another one is along the railway lines. And now these routes are are quite you know quite scary for some some of the um, residents to walk around very poorly lit. And, and the patrol, policing patrol around them areas, it, it would have to be on, you know, obviously on foot because it, these are sort of foot access points. Um, and that, that would sort of, you know, encourage people more to use that car park at the moment. It's not, not very well used. Thank you. We definitely say there's a lot of issues about the car park. I guess the challenge of pushback generally, it's fully lit. We're never going to be able to solve that as a police service because yes. we're not responsible for street lighting. So if there are areas, that are poorly lit, that's impacting on people's feelings of safety, then I think that either goes to the private contractor who's responsible for the site or comes into that local authority. Now, the challenge we've all got is that we don't have bags of money, do we? So it's trying to problem solve ourselves out of that, isn't it, as a collective? But that's the observation I make about some of the street lighting stuff. I'd rather, if, if people are safe because there's good lighting, I'd rather have that than a cop, because the cop could be in the town centre type of thing. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah, 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 I agree. Um, uh, so, so just to. Do, oh, okay. oh, um, Okay, thank you. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Uh, obviously, your presentation, thank you for your presentation. You've answered all the questions which I'm, I was concerned about it. So, but going back to the nighttime economy, especially in Windsor, where Councillor Boren and myself, we are the ward councillor uh, down there. You see, the thing is, at the moment, because of the cold weather, it's quiet. But when the weather gets warmer, the summer is get very busy. And I've noticed that usually the police are stationed down the William Street, front of the liquid, and down the arches. So the two places they are stationed. And 
because of their station down there, the other places, there are not much presence of police and the antisocial behavior is spread down the other area, Senators uh, Road, uh, the King Street, all the uh, Alma Road and Oxford Street, all those roads. So is there any specific reason that you're stationed there and instead of spreading out or, I mean, what are the main reasons for that? If you... I'll, I'll pass it over to local officers ar around that general point. Your, your point around the weather affecting crime, spot on. Police officers love rain. We're a very depressing group of people. If it's raining, particularly around nighttime economy, it just absolutely kills the nighttime economy. And everyone goes home, there's no trouble at taxi ranks or at restaurants and all that kind of stuff. So we're, we're rather depressing because we love a bit of bad weather. But if I hand over to John for your point around the patrol strategy. It's like William Street and the Arches because that's where the majority of the, the people are. But there should be, as part of the patrols within with the number of officers that we've got, doing roving patrols as well. So that should be covered. They can't, we can't cover everywhere. So with those two where the main, most people are, and then with the, the, the pairs of officers doing patrols throughout the evening, then that should get some coverage. But we'll feed that back into the nighttime economy review as well. Thank so you very much. Thank you. Try and communicate with uh, Matthew Barber. Are you there, Matthew Barber? I certainly am, Chairman. Can you hear me now? Good. Um, I'll give you the opportunity for your overview. And if you can answer any of the additional, uh, I won't put you to the test on questions, but um, please go ahead. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Uh, apologies, we had some technology uh, problems earlier. And I'm grateful for the uh, committee allowing me to join remotely because I've had some logistical uh, challenges of getting down to uh, Maidenhead Day. Uh, I think a, a lot of the, the things I wanted to touch on have been helpfully covered by uh, the Chief Constable in his presentation, but just wanted to touch on where some of my priorities are for the coming year. And a lot of that focuses, um, as you might expect, around police numbers, which has been something that many members have touched on. In the budget that was uh, agreed last week and ratified by the uh, Police and Crime Panel, I'm pleased to say with cross-party support, um, I'm funding locally um, 80 additional police officers over and above our, our previous establishment, and they should be um, uh, on the book starting their training by uh, the end of this financial year. We are hoping to uh, exceed our home office um, recruitment target by uh, around 80 officers. And without this additional investment that we're putting in as part of this budget, uh, the default position would have been that we, we simply return uh, back down to our previous establishment. This builds those additional 80 into our establishment for the future. I think that's a, a welcome move. And working with uh, both John Campbell and uh, Jason Hogg, who's the incoming Chief Constable, uh, I've got the commitment that those additional officers will all go into community policing. And I'm hoping that that will be just the start of the increase in community police officers that we see across Thames Valley. It's clearly been something that many members have raised. It's something that your constituents, my constituents, uh, will uh, share a concern about. Uh, and as the Chief Constable has said, it, professionally, there are lots of challenges in policing that aren't about visible policing. There's domestic abuse, uh, there's the online sex abuse, there are a huge amount of calls on policing time, which isn't about the, the traditional foot patrol. But there are also an awful lot of uh, problems that are about uh, the visible local policing where officers get to know their community. Uh, and so over time, and it's not something that we will be able to turn around overnight, but as we are at this high point now where we've got more police officers in Thames Valley than we've ever had before, now is the time to invest in community policing teams uh, and make sure we can try and turn that big ship of policing around uh, and ensure that actually we put the money into proactive policing uh, in order to reduce some of that demand on the 999 calls that's all we've already been referred to, of course. Um, yeah, we can't stop that. Uh, tonight uh, in Windsor, in Maidenhead, there will be calls to 999 and Thames Valley Police need to answer those calls quickly and they need to respond to them appropriately. Uh, so we can't just turn that off. But over time, if we can become a more proactive force, uh, then hopefully we can uh, look to offset some of that demand uh, by preventing crime rather than clearly, uh, rather than really just uh, clearing up the mess, if you like, afterwards and dealing with the investigations. So uh, the first part of that crime fighting strategy that I I'm wanting to set out for the force is around the digital contact and 101. Uh, discussions were even had about that. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, Councillor Del Campo who referenced you know, her her experience of 101. Uh, as has been said, it's not it's not all bad, but it's the bad experiences that people will talk about, and there are, are certainly bad experiences, which is why it's one of the areas that I uh, hold the chief constable to account to uh, on a regular basis. We could invest in people to answer the phones um, uh, more quickly to achieve our target simply by workforce 
the estimate is we'd need, need about six million pounds uh, extra. Well, that's probably uh, an increase of around a, another uh, 25 odd pounds in council tax, uh, which is beyond the limit of what I could, could levy, even if uh, I were inclined to do so. And that would simply get us to the target of where we want to be uh, on answering the telephone. Where we're looking to go instead is about enhancing the uh, route of digital contact, because I think um, we've gone to the days where public bodies such as the police, such as local authorities, tended to push people. Uh, you know, Ten years ago, we were pushing people um, uh, from visiting us in person to the telephones, and then we pushed people from telephones to online. Now there is much more of a public pull. The comparison I always use is if your uh, if your Amazon delivery is is late, uh, you would probably be quite aghast if Amazon told you you had to ring up uh, and wait on the phone to talk to someone. You simply expect to look at your telephone and see where it's got to. Uh, and I think we should be in that space in policing. So over the next uh, year, 18 months, we'll be developing a new system uh, which will allow victims of crime to get updates on where their crimes are online. That accounts for about 15 to 20 percent of calls to 101, immediate relieving some of that pressure. But I think the, the gold standard for me is being able to contact the police online, not just using the website, which is a great way of doing it, uh, but by using things like WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger, those things that we already use in our daily lives, not having to download a dedicated app, but just allowing you to send messages to the police in the way uh, that you would do to your friends. Uh, and the reason behind that is that if you if you go on your local Facebook uh, groups, which I'm sure you as councillors are are all part of, you will be well aware that there will be lots of concerns that the public will very freely uh, report on Facebook in their Facebook groups, uh, what's going on in their town, what's going on in their village. Uh, it doesn't mean it's been reported to the council. It doesn't mean it's been reported to the police. We need to make it as easy as that uh, for people to report their concerns. Because without that, the police, your local commander, uh, uh, Claire, won't have the information in order to work out where those patrols need to be, where to put the resources. So it's really important that we build the confidence in policing, not just in the visible uh, numbers that we put in place, but in the confidence to be able to report and know uh, that you're going to be listened to. So it's about developing that new online offer, but also uh, that, will, that will in itself, <clears throat> excuse me, take pressure off of the 101 service to allow those people who want to or need to telephone on the non-emergency line uh, to be able to do so more freely. We then get into the into the numbers game and really boosting those uh, neighbourhood policing teams. I would like in the short term to be able to double the number of officers in our community policing teams, but even that should be a down payment. Uh, it should be the start of a process of really turning the force around uh, to put even more officers into, into that area. I think uh, we should be very grateful uh, to John Campbell and his time as Chief Constable has really uh, maintained neighbourhood policing when other forces uh, have done away with it, um, and we've uh, we've we've absolutely tried to maintain uh, what we can in some very difficult times. Uh, but now we have the opportunity uh, not just to maintain but to enhance. And so I think uh, over the coming uh, year or two, we'll be able to see some big increases in that. And fundamentally, that all comes around to being much more proactive. It's about working more closely uh, with uh, with you as a local authority in some of the proactive work that can be done. It's about working with the community to understand the growing crime, crime trends and to be proactive uh, and focus on prevention uh, rather than simply uh, dealing with offences as they're, as they're reported to the police. So that's definitely the direction of, uh, of travel um, that I would like to see for Thames Valley. If there's any, um, any further questions for the, the more detailed operational ones, uh, obviously very happy to, uh, to take those, Jem. Okay, there's um, one question, uh, which is Councillor Davey. A question, please. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Matthew. Um, there was talk on um, social media just recently about this. The uh, RB uh, about you talking to councils. Are you talking to RBWM about taking over the CCTV system? Um, and if so, would you be looking to purchase that from the borough, or would you expect us to give it to you? Uh, so, the, so what I've talked to all local authorities about, and I've made this very clear at the um, at the police and crime panel, and I think, Councillor David, I'm probably seeing you later in this week uh, at, a, at another meeting. Very happy to uh, to fill you in in more detail. Um, what I what I proposed uh, probably about a year or so ago now was that we develop a uh, a Thames Valley wide network of CCTV. Um, RBWM is probably in in a unique position in Thames Valley of having one of the best and well managed uh, CCTV networks, largely because of some of the big events that you manage uh, within uh, within town. But that is definitely not the case 
uh, across the whole of Thames Valley. And what we have is a patchwork where uh, the amount that the police or the local authority pay in varies. Some are staffed by TVP, some are staffed by local authorities, etc. And that makes for a pretty poor patchwork. What I'm hoping to do is to develop a Thames Valley wide network, which is ideally, in my view, owned, monitored and maintained by Thames Valley Police and uh, that we would uh, still seek a contribution from local authorities at the moment it's generally owned by councils uh, who pay a significant amount and Thames Valley Police pay a smaller contribution to it I want to turn that around accepting that Thames Valley Police are the biggest customer if you like for CCTV uh, but recognizing that we all have a duty in terms of community safety so see still seeking a contribution uh, from local authorities going forward and, and we would look to novate contracts we look to move everything to one system now it's on a voluntary basis. Not every local authority will want to take part. Uh, we're focusing on those areas which are either in most need or most willing at the moment. So Slough is probably most likely to go first, along with Milton Keynes. Uh, we're having conversations with Oxfordshire because they are uh, they're really keen to do this and move to one control room. Uh, and, and then, to, if you like, working along the, the Berkshire corridor. So there's certainly been some initial conversations with, with RBWM. At the moment, the focus is on those other councils I've mentioned simply because we want to build the network if you like present and to be able to then for present the offer to rbwm and say well look this is what our new network looks like are you interested in joining it uh, on on that basis so it's very early stages as far as winter and maidenhead are concerned but that's still the direction of travel i'd like to go because i think there's some wider public benefit in us all still contributing to a system but getting a better quality system as a result fair enough um you announced 750k I've got, a few count. I've got a few questions. That's what well, we're I'm here for. Sorry, saying. but we'll have to restrict the number for Councillor Singh to speak. Come on. Because we're we, here, we've come to sit here to have a meeting to discuss this and listen to him and ask questions. And, and you're saying we're not allowed to ask questions. I'm not saying not allowed. I'm restricting the number of questions. The well, council. If you if you've told us that beforehand, I could have asked one concise question. Well, I'm sorry. Councillor Singh, please a question. That, Yes. Thank, thank you, sir. That, that, thank you for um, for that explanation, Matthew. Matthew, um, in Maidenhead, we we've been uh, struggling. I know you uh, well done on your um, recruitment drive, and you know your ambition to recruit another eighty officers. That's very much welcomed. In Maidenhead, we've been struggling with community policing uh, for some time. Um, we we did have uh, uh, many ward community wardens, uh, twenty odd wardens. Uh, with the ambition for us, and we're, uh, we're down to six. So we have serious financial constraints, uh, as, as does Thames Valley Police. Now, uh, there was a high profile campaign uh, by the Met Police who were recruiting officers from Thames Valley Police and paying them extra money uh, to move to um, the Met Police. Can, can, you, can you tell me, uh, what are you doing to address this issue of officers being poached from Thames Valley and moving to uh, the Met Police, please, and being offered five thousand pound, you know, as, as a, a, yeah. a bonus? Thank you. But by all means, so um, that thankfully, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's had no effect, uh, but that thankfully hasn't had the effect that I think many officers feared that it might, particularly for those areas um, uh, bordering uh, the Met. But let's be frank, for, for many people, when the, the cost of living is increasing, uh, the idea of moving a few miles down the road and getting £5,000 um, uh, for, for doing so uh, is, is quite tempting. Uh, so we can't ignore that fact. Um, last, uh, last year, uh, in consultation with the, the Chief Constable, we were quite restricted on what we can do in terms of officer pay, set by regulation. Uh, but we did increase the uh, South East allowance, which is the only bit of flexibility we've got. We've increased that to the maximum we can pay. It's still not as good as an offer from the Met to uh, to go and join and get the extra five thousand, but that's that's the limit of what we can legally do. I think what we can do is look at some of the some of the softer things to make to make officers' lives better. Look at some of the welfare issues. And there's a lot of work going on in the force uh, to make sure that we can retain and recruit on that basis. Uh, and yeah, through the Home Office, I've been challenging uh, the Mayor of London on that because I think. Uh, what was planned for a start doesn't actually benefit policing overall. It would simply poach officers from one place to another. And it looks like the Met will probably be uh, the only, if or one of the only forces that doesn't meet its recruitment target at a time when Thames Valley Police are overachieving. No, I'm not complacent about that. We've got some challenges in continuing to recruit. I want to see more officers in addition to the 80 I've talked about. We've got provision in the budget, which I promised at the election, which would be to 
continue to recruit, not just to maintain our numbers, but to increase our numbers in line with our population growth um, over uh, over the next few years, and that's budgeted for. Uh, so that, uh, that I think, yeah, that's a challenge and an opportunity, uh, but it's very stark that at the time we're doing that, the Met are struggling to achieve um, their, their uplift. So I think we just have to continue to push back against the Met and continue to support our officers locally as best we can. Thank, thank you very much for that. Um, could, could, Mayor, could I have one more um, question? Oh, 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 oh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is, uh, again, about the community police officers. How many of those officers we will see in the Gaparo, especially in the rural communities, where we don't see anybody at all? At the moment, the police presence is non-existent. Uh, Chief Constable, is that a, an operational question that you're better suited to? He might have frozen as well. Uh, <laughs> we do have a rural crime task force that we had start last year of an inspector, two sergeants and 20 PCs that are having, a, are having an effect in London. Of the rural particular bars and particular locations in operational matters. Right, I think that was the same thing, was it? <laughs> um, certainly but, there, there is patrol activity, not what we've seen, but... Sorry, Chairman, I... Am I back now? Oh, <laughs> yes, you're back now. Ah, excellent. Thank you. Um, I, I saw the Chief Constable um, uh, kindly stepping in to try and answer. Hopefully I won't contradict him with anything that I uh, was trying to say whilst talking to a blank screen. Uh, the, um, uh, so I think I, I would say there, there certainly are efforts in the, uh, in the rural communities. And of course, we have a rural crime task force now, which covers uh, force wide uh, and deals with some of those issues of uh, of rural crime and things beyond rural crime around uh, some of the activity that will be taking place in the wider community and indeed on our on our road network. The allocation of officers uh, across the force to either local policing areas or within local police areas to rural or urban is a matter for operational policing. Uh, and so that's one for the chief constable and the local commander. Uh, my desire is to see that all local communities uh, get the coverage they need. That's why I want those additional community <laughs> police officers in place. And that's why I want us to continue to recruit uh, PCSOs to build up those numbers. In an ideal world, when we get there, I'm quite interested in the idea of linking some of those allocations to uh, the um, uh, what the ONS use of that uh, lo uh, the, the local super output areas um, to, uh, to understand policing numbers. Now, we're not there yet. We simply haven't got uh, the structure in place to do that. But I think that is an interesting way of looking forward. And as the force looks at these new numbers, I think it's quite right. We look at the resource allocation formula, which is some years since it was uh, since it was probably last revisited within Thames Valley. But as I say, uh, ultimately, the allocation of individual officers to individual areas is one for Chief Constable. Thank you. OK, thank you. Now, it's my responsibility to manage the meeting. I am very concerned about the Youth Council here. So that's the end of the questioning for the Chief Constable and the Commissioner behind me. Thank you very much, Mr Barber and Mr Campbell. And I wish you well in your future. Yes. Councillors, can we move on now to the Youth Council, please? Councillor Bra, Councillor De Campo. Any comments you have to make, you can address it as a complaint. And any behaviour like yourself, which is on Zoom. Thank you very much for listening to that extensive uh, presentation. I'll try and keep my words brief. Uh, I'm sure you have an opportunity to speak now, and I welcome Alexander Wood and Holly Hannam to this matter in the ONS, which is your opportunity for the Youth Council. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for letting us speak to you today. I'm Holly, the Chair of the Youth Council. And I'm Alexander, the Vice Chair of the Youth Council. We are here today to address the issue of a lack of lighting within our borough. And may we ask that all questions are left to the end of our presentation. Um, 
Um, so for those who haven't met us before, um, we just have a little background to who we are. We were first established in August 2021 following a cabinet decision to set up the Leaf Council. To be a member, you must be 14 to 19 years of age, living, attending or attending education or part of a youth organisation in the borough. And the Youth Council's aim is to represent all young people from across the borough. Next slide. <laughs> Our aims as a youth council are to represent all the views and needs of all young people, to act as advisors to RBWM and liaise with council, businesses and other organisations, to celebrate the achievements of young people in RBWM and to work on projects that are of interest to us and to raise awareness of young people's views and interests. Next slide. So um, a bit of background about the Lighting Report. In January last year, we wrote a letter to the council as part of the budget consultation for the past year. And following this in February, we, invite, we were invited to attend a meeting with Councillor Carroll, Councillor Hilton and Kevin McDaniel, who wanted to address most of the concerns that were raised in our letter. One of our main concerns highlighted in our letter and in the meeting is the issue of safety due to the lack or poor lighting in our bar. We were asked to produce a report on the condition of street lighting within RBWM from our perspective. A working group led by Youth Councillor Katie Holden compiled the report with input from everyone in the Youth Council. We were due to present the report to you in September, but due to the passing of the late Queen, this meeting was cancelled. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Um, so according to the College of Policing, five studies conducted in the UK revealed that 38 fewer crimes per 100 occurred when an area was well lit compared to areas with little to no street lighting. In the studies con conducted by Painter and Farringdon in 2001, in Dudley and Stroke and Trent, it was concluded that the financial savings from reducing, for reducing crimes greatly exceeded the financial costs of improving street lighting installed. What, and we want to ask why wouldn't this be the same for our borough? According to the group Counting Dead Women, 139 women were killed by men in 2021. In 2020, it was revealed that Thames Valley ranked sixth on the list of the highest number of women killed by men. Next slide, please. We believe that the issue of street lighting is of paramount importance for our safety and the safety of others in our borough. Many of us were worried after the death of Sarah, Sarah Everard and what the implications would be for many women and girls. The issue also affects boys. When we discussed this in the Youth Council, we were all said we are worried about walking home in the dark. Good street lighting helps us to feel safe when we're out with our friends and when walking home. Good street lighting also helps to reduce road traffic collisions and also protects pedestrians generally by increasing visibility. Next slide, please. We think that broken light bulbs and inadequate lighting structures make areas of our borough look neglected and our concerns are very much rooted in the more rural areas of the borough, such as the villages of Datchet, Raysbury and Old Windsor. We are concerned by how dark and potentially unsafe the alleyways across the borough are. Youth councillors have observed that street lighting is very scant in many areas of the borough. Next slide, please. As the map shows, we'll start with picture one. This area is Birchett's Green. It is a small village, mainly made up of mostly private roads. However, it is also a main route for students walking home from Berkshire College of Agriculture. These roads are very poorly lit up. Picture two is showing the road linking Datchet and Windsor. There is absolutely no lighting along the stretch of road which crosses the river and passes by large exposed playing fields. And then we also have Ascot Road, specifically near where the houses are on the curve. There are no pavements or street lighting down there and the traffic is very usually fast moving. We also raise clue field in Windsor as an issue as it is very poorly lit and is often used by people seeking parking further out of the town centre. Next slide please. 
and then the house has some areas concerned that we don't have pictures for. So we have the Windsor Road, where there is absolutely no lighting along the stretch of road linking Datchet and Windsor, which crosses the river and passes by the large exposed playing fields. And we also have the Ascot Road, specifically near where the house is. Oh, we already went over that bit, so it's just that point again. Next slide, please. We don't want less than adequate lighting, or in fact, no lighting in some areas of our borough. We want a borough where we feel safe and want the council to improve lighting in our borough and protect the residents. We are here to help and we want to work with you to find solutions so that action is taken rather than the just constant conversation. Yep, so um, thank you for your time. We will now try and answer any questions that you have. Right, we have a number of councillors that want to ask questions. Um, they may ask questions about yourself or linked to lighting, right? But also alongside me is the direct, executive director of PLACE and the, uh, and the colleague, Elise, um, where they will be able to give the technical briefing or anything or reasons why there may not be lighting because specific roads do need lighting and some are different. Um, so, Councillor Greg Jones. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Holly and Alexander. That was uh, an excellent presentation. Well done. Um, a couple of things I would raise. In my ward, we've had some street lights that have been hit by cars or damaged and down, and it can sometimes take, you know, six months to a year to get those replaced. And you report them, and the problems that are raised are stock levels or liaising with the electricity board to get them fixed up and that sort of thing. So, and that's one reason why it perhaps seems to take longer um, for, for them to be fixed. The other thing I'd say is um, you've got to be a bit careful because some people object to having a street light outside their house because they don't want the light pollution in their bedroom window or, you know, that sort of thing. So putting lights everywhere isn't for everyone. And I just wondered if you've considered that in your report. Um, yes, we have considered the, um, well, first we agree with you for reporting issues, we have highlighted that we found quite a lot of lights, that there is lights, they're just not working. We did work with officers at the time to kind of, just kind of raise that to their attention. With the objections, that's why we tend to focus more on the rural areas. We try to focus on that because that's also a lot where the walking does happen in the rural areas. We also discussed with officers at the time about what measures can be put in to reduce the lighting pollution. Yeah, uh, Holly and Alexander, thank you very much. I, I did read your report in, in some detail. Um, there is another side to this. As you, there's usually two sides to most questions. And in this particular one, there is another school of thought that street lighting is not a good thing. It's bad for wildlife. Uh, there's a study we've done, which I suggest you take it down and give, uh, there's a 32 page report can I give you this, the, uh, you know, the internet connection, as I pronounce, www. Dot, and then it's North Wessex, Wessex Downs, W-E-S-S-E-X-D-O-W-N-S -S 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 dot org dot UK. I can send and, that to you in writing yeah. as well. For <laughs> yeah, you. If, if, yeah they, they'll, they'll get, you'll get it down for, the, for Holly and so on. No, and, and the fact in that, People don't like a lot of artificial light. You can't see the stars at night. Um, and in that report, which you'll see, um, that it isn't a given that installing light for security will deter crime. There is no proven link between lighting levels and crime rates. In trials where, this is what this report says, I know yours says something different. Uh, in trials where street lighting has been switched off, there has been no increase in crime rates. In fact, bright exterior lights may create contrasting dark spots that criminals can hide in. So there is there is a there's another side that I just wanted to point that point that point out to you. To you. And these LED, LED lights are, are not too good for public health either. And as uh, uh, Councillor Greg said, 
um, human beings, you know, go to sleep at night and there's that Arcadian rhythm that human beings have. And that's the reason they don't like a street light right outside their bedroom window. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'll pick up on your environment and wildlife, but something I'd put back to you is um, what's more important, environment or safety? And that's a huge problem we're facing at the moment. You know, it's not just women, girls, boys, but, you know, they're walking along the streets and we've got so many dark streets as in the one we just said about Thatcher in Windsor. And, you know, they're walking along and it's many school children that are walking along that road and they're walking to school at like walking to and back from school at 4 p.m. pitch black. And what are you supposed to do? You know, anyone could just come along and harass them. And I am a strong supporter of the environment and I understand why there isn't lights in certain areas, but we're facing a huge safety issue at the moment and lighting makes people feel safer. So that's what I'd say in response to that. Um, the problem with women being attacked is a society problem. It won't be solved by lighting. Necessarily. Thank you, Jay. Um, I thank you very much for your presentation. I think it's good that you brought it to this uh, panel because it's very important. And I, as I mentioned, the police earlier, we had very recently in the last two, two weeks, we've had two incidents and it has come to us. And there's another one where a child from charter school was attacked, but the parents doesn't, the mother doesn't want us to bring it out in the, you know, in the open. She wants it to keep it confidential. We have three schools in our area in Sunningdale, all where the biggest school is charters and the girl was, one of them was from there. And uh, we have the Cheapside Primary School. There are two lights, just two lights on that road. And it's about 200 by yards or 300 yards separate from each other. I mean, that far it's dark. And all the trees, the big trees are covering it. So there are no lights. It's not well lit. lit. Children from the schools use the train Sunday to go home from charters or anywhere nearby. And they do not get any, um, there's no lights over there. It came to us three years ago and this was brought to the council. I brought it to the council and complained about it. And I haven't heard, there was one light put because there was one incident down there and it was one light on Broom Hall on the bed at the, by, the, uh, by the farm. So I do understand and I've been on this case all that I'm asking for extra light because of the school children in that area. There are three schools in that area, Cheapside, uh, the primary school, uh, Holy Trinity, and uh, we have charters, the biggest school. And I think it's very important for the safety of the children who finish school very late, sometimes really late, and they're walking home from school in that dark. So I really applaud you for bringing this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hunt. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and Thank you very much and welcome to the Town Hall. Um, it was really very well uh, written present presentation. Um, Birchett's Green uh, is part in my ward and the other part is in Councillor Bra's ward. Um, now you mentioned BCA, which is actually in my ward, but the entrance is in Councillor Bra's ward. So I'm sure maybe Councillor Brawl wants to speak about that as well. Um, uh, Councillor Brawl and myself were standing outside BCA College on Birchett's Green Road only the other day. At, uh, I would think it was uh, the end of the day for the children. And um, the amount of buses that went in was quite, quite something. It's, it is in a rural area. And I'm wondering who walks to BCA? I'm not aware that anybody walks. Obviously you do know. Do you? Well, all of these um, pieces were compiled from youth counsellors who went, I know, that, I believe that one was sent in specifically from someone who was a student last year at BCA. And they said that that came from most of some of their friends that mentioned that area. Not only that, it's more also just people living in that area as well, because it is an open area that goes between those roads, it's quite a shortcut area. I believe, I don't really know that area, you're more the main head side, I'm more the winter side. 
um, I believe there's some small rural shopping area that be, I think, on the map. There's no shops no. nearby, <laughs> nothing. Um, so there's no bus stop. Well, there's a bus stop at the end, end of BCA College on the road. Um, so I would think that, you know, anybody will get that. But mostly the buses actually go in now to BCA because uh, that's what we had done recently, having the bus go into the college itself to collect the children. Um, so it will be interesting to know who would actually benefit with the streetlights, um, not on the college site, but actually Birchett's Green Road, which is the, the street. Also, uh, there are uh, residents who don't want streetlights. And I think in the parishes, you need to do consultation with the village association and the two parish councils involved, because it was mentioned to me at the meeting um, the other day uh, by one member, parish councillor, they don't want to see any more street lights and mentioned about signs as well. But anyway, that's another thing. So if you take this further, find out the usage of Birchett's Green Road, um, how many people actually walk from the college uh, in the evening and also you know if that's the case then do your consultations okay it's just a way forward that you might like to take thank you right of opinion right as to what you said and what the knowledge is of the local councillors so i'll pass it over now to councillor john davy please thank you chair thank you guys for coming in um, your youth councillors were full councillors. Um, this around this table, you have the opportunity this evening, if you so wish, to suggest a motion that could be taken up by this council to move something forward. Yeah, so I just want to put that in your minds because we can do something tonight, we don't have to postpone. And, talk, and just talk about it and present it now and then just talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. If you've got something that you would like to achieve after you've heard from the other councillors, then bring something forward, yeah? Thank you. I can advise you both on that if you do want to have a word privately before, just in terms of uh, how we go forward as well. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, as uh, Councillor Hunt said, BCA is partly in my ward. There are some children from Cookham who take the bus to BCA. Um, obviously, the bus stop just outside BCA. So there is no lighting. Yeah. Okay. okay. My main question is to the officers, um, just to ask what plan have you got uh, to increase street lighting in the areas of safety? For example, do you have a list of areas of concern or are, there, are they rated by priority? <coughs> Do we then, Molly and Alexander, to the officer that's responsible for that question by councillor to the officer? Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Barr. Um, what I might do is just sort of pause and come back to a couple of points I was going to mention sort of by way of summing up and then colleagues Elise and, and, and Charles who's online might want to to add some comment to that so there's probably a few points here that panel members have made as well as Alexander and Holly that, that I can sort of wrap up at the yeah. at the end to conclude yeah. chair that's that's but I'll pick your point up then Councillor Brown. That's fine Thanks. thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Chair. Um, I was going to suggest something, and now um, I don't want to steal Holly and Alexander's thunder if, if they do wish to make a suggestion. Um, but it, it does seem to me that this, 
this is a potential work item for this forum. Um, we, you know, there are the widely publicised issues with, um, you know, lights not working at the moment. Um, I think it's worth looking into that this <coughs> forum. But I also wonder, and, and I'm aware I'm not a regular member, so, you know, I'm potentially creating work <laughs> for the rest of you here. Uh, but I wonder whether there's potential for a, for a task and finish um, to look at the lighting issues in the borough um, and perhaps invite members of the Youth Council onto that task and finish group um, and work collaboratively with them. Good idea. That could be a way forward, yes. So, uh, yeah. yeah. And Polly and Alexander, of course, certain terms here you might be unfamiliar with so once we have like i said once we have gone through all of the questions and stuff we can have a chat just to set the record straight for what you what's on the table and options you have before we put you on the spot so yeah just to put your minds at rest so moving to councillor singh thank you chair uh thank you holly thank you uh, alexander for presentation and thank you to uh, Katie Holden for writing the report and all the youth councillors. You know, you've done a great job here bringing this to the uh, scrutiny panel. Um, this is an issue, uh, if you look through the previous agendas and uh, the, the previous panel, which was the infrastructure over the scrutiny panel, um, you know, I've been raising this issue for the last two years to uh, come on this, come on a panel and be reviewed. This is a serious, serious issue. Um, it's been highlighted by the Sarah, Sarah, Ever, Sarah Everard case. Um, it's a bit disappointing that Thames Valley Police have been, uh, I'm not here, I'm not sure if we've still got a police crime commissioner here, but it'd be really good to put some of these uh, points to the Thames Valley Police. Um, you know, some of the facts that you've stated here, uh, that is, you know, six highest uh, police force for women being killed uh, is, is a very, very serious statement. And it would have been helpful to have a response from Thames Valley Police um for for that um locally um there's issues uh, close to saint mary's ward i represent ludlow road brownfield gardens um the lack of lighting there uh, commonly known locally as a gullet um it's a very very scary place at night um wessex way uh the underpass which was uh poorly lit for uh, several months and the lights were out that has been a crime hotspot uh, in the past and um, <clears throat> an area which where we, we, we should have it um, well lit and thank you very much for raising that issue. Um, I'll, I'll be making a trip down there and having a, a look at it, making sure doing a visual inspection there of the area. Um, now s some of the the issues that you're you're raising now if, if you can bring a motion forward, if you do want to take some time out to have a, have a, have a break and have a look at that, it, I think it'd be um, useful to have recommendation to go forward um, because we, you know, this is something that needs to be re reviewed um, and it will be helpful. A street lighting I've mentioned earlier, you know, around um, the St. Mary's Ward where the new car park is, a lot of uh, my residents are intimidated going back and forth to the new car park. Uh, people who live in the town centre and these, these blocks of flats are making a long walk and, and some of these areas are quite dark and quite scary. Um, and with a lack of community wardens, it, it is an issue. Um, so- um, The borough, are you asking or putting questions to the two youth councils? Uh, yeah. This is an extensive statement you made about a number of areas. Please I'm, put a question to them. I'm speaking to the youth council. No, you're not speaking. Can we put some questions? It's an overview and scrutiny matter. Uh, <clears throat> one of the questions I, I would like to put to you is um, uh, over the, the period of survey that you've been carrying out. Now, is the, the number of street lights which are out around the borough, have you seen an increase in uh, lights out? Uh, around the borough because this is something that residents have highlighted to me and I just wanted to get some feedback from you guys if that's an issue or is it an issue purely with um, a, a general poor lighting infrastructure around the borough? Obviously we can't you know comment for the entire borough because obviously you know we can't be everywhere at once. 
Um, I have seen lights out and obviously they are not being fixed as highlighted and that is something we want, you know, more active intervention, you know, and a better system of being able to report things. Um, we would also say that this report has obviously gone a lot bigger than we thought it was. We don't, we didn't, we don't have the resources to have the ongoing data. This was something that there was a few weeks, probably springish time, that a few youth councillors who felt comfortable to, because obviously we young people specifically go into unlit areas, which is not the best mix. So we tried to do it more in the summer, so we are, we'll probably missed some areas because we don't have the resources to to do this long-term investigation yeah. what we would say is that we saw this as a problem with the rising number of attacks post post covid and it's just something that we've identified at the time we don't have the long-term kind of viewpoint on it and this report was done in 2022 like early on and we haven't actively been keeping on top of it if that makes sense we haven't actually been com like keep on like reporting and updating our report our report was done then and we submitted it and we haven't written another one since and that, 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 that'd be useful because um like, like as a youth council i mean you you guys are eyes and ears on the street because you're you're Generally, a lot of the youngsters are on foot patrol, on their bikes, they're out and about, you know, councillors, you know, driving around in big, great big Jaguars and, you know, they, 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 might, they, might, they might not be affected. Stop this behaviour. I'm just right? saying, you know, you guys see the issues. Um, can like, you keep it, keep it as a question, not a comment about okay. councillors driving around in vehicles? Okay. Now, the, there, there has been a, um, a process around the borough of the lights being removed. Um, I raised this at, at full council. Um, uh, so on, on, on the main road to the highways um, where we had uh, the, the, the beacons, um, these have uh, been systematically removed and uh, reflective um, beacons have been put in place. Now, I, this did offer a little bit of passive lighting uh, around you know, the highways and sort of um, a little bit of safety and security around the area. Now, is, is this, uh, have, you, have you noticed anything with these reflective beacons and sort of when the cars are, are not about on the highways, um, is, is that adding to the, 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 sense of, um, the sense of concern, you know, around the four-leaf area? First of all, Alexander and Bollett, do you know what reflective beacon is? <laughs> Because I've, this is the first time I've heard of it, as opposed uh, to a street light. The, 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 the Councillor Singh, the, please. I personally haven't brushed that part of my highway code up. So Sorry. No, my highway code. <laughs> studying for my driving license. <laughs> not got to that bit yet. Good, so no. thank you. I so, think sorry, that, not, that, not the beacon. Though. That what, what concludes the, your question, Councillor Singh, please. But I was referring to the... the no, website. you won't at the moment. Right, so, Councillor Schilling. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Holly and Alexandra for coming here. Uh, it, it is very important, lighting is, is, is very important for security, uh, also lighting a CCTV. So uh, we need to look at the lighting, but uh, the officers here, I think they, they will answer the most of the issue. But my thing is, what, what it is, it's a big borough. There are specific issue in specific ward. So if you want to solve those sort of problems, what we need to do, we need, you should, I think my view would be to specify the ward, see to the ward council and the officer and say, this, this is the area where we need to check. Because some of the places you are not, you might not allow to put any light, or we don't know. There are some uh, difficulties could be. So the best way to go forward is if you pick up the specific area and see which ward it is and sit with the ward councilor and the officers, and get this done. I think this will be a better way of going it. If you try to do a whole borough together, I mean, we don't know which is the problem area and which are not. So my suggestion would be, especially to specific area, what councillor and the officers, and I think this will be the best way to going forward. Thank you very much, Anuria. Anyway. Mm -hmm.
Here is Chairman, I will not accept the question from Councillor Luxton or Councillor Jones, right? And I will get a reply, hopefully here from... No, I'm apologising that you can't. I know it's, I've had that little sign from that side as well. So we're trying to get the officers in to give an explanation about the technical and probably financial reasons. Yes. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Chair. And uh, I know you've been thanked a few times. We're going to thank you both as well for, for attending this evening and um, give, giving the presentation. Um, and I suppose I'm, I'm looking down at my screen, so I've made a few notes as we've been discussing. So, so I'm just going to pick, make sure I pick out the, the pertinent points. As ch the Chair mentioned, I've got Lee Strachan, Head of um, Neighbourhood Services, got Andy Aldridge, Community Safety Manager, and also got, got Charles online, who's more of our lighting specialist, if you like, who can answer any particular technical detailed questions tonight. But um, I think from my point of view, not just on this matter, but actually on everything that we do at the Council, we need to engage better with you at, at the Youth Council. And I think I made the point to the committee um, in our first place ONS. So this became a place ONS and there's a people and there's a corporate as well, all looking at slightly different aspects of the council. Place is very much where this item fits, which is why, why you're here tonight and any further discussions, which I think this might lead to some members around the room have sort of suggested already that we might bring this back to place ONS potentially. And that might be part of the motion that we come on to. Uh, shortly, but I'll be very supportive of working with you going forwards, thinking about your precious time as well, when it's best to work, do that work with you. I know you've got school and college and driving lesson commitments and other things going on, so we'll have to think about that, but we'll, we'll sort of maybe conclude with some of that in, in a moment. And we've heard there's lots of competing priorities, as always, with all things. Um, there's competing priorities, whether that's sort of the sustainability issues, maintaining the rural look and feel of the place and people's um, pe people's homes and, and streets and, and, and where they live versus the more sort of urban settings that we see in our sort of town centres and sort of compared to London and other places, which is very lit at times. So, that, that, so there's all those things. There's nature and there's sort of the economic uh, aspects of this as well about lighting levels uh, and dimming and, 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 and all of those things to sort of sort of deal with. Councillor Shalim makes a really good point there towards the end about the locations and you helpfully have picked out with your photographs and the map that you put in your presentation some specific locations that quite quickly we can look at with you and think about what is going on there. Um, but it, it's true to say that each location is different, uh, got different things going on. Um, and, and often require different treatments to sort of find the right solution for those. But, you know, there, there's different things we can, we can look at. And whilst I mentioned about the different competing priorities, I do agree with you that your safety and all of our residents' safety in the borough is paramount. So, yes, there are competing priorities, but we've got to look after one another in terms of our, our sort of the people that, that live here in, 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 in Windsor, Maidenhead and beyond. So... That is paramount. Um, resident survey, that's also something that we perhaps should look at. There's, there's probably uh, information in the resident survey that, that, that sits well alongside what you've described in terms of particularly uh, women and girls feeling less safe during darkness uh, when outside. So that, that definitely sort of fits with, with what you're, you're picking up in, in, in your findings. Overall, Quite a lot of people feel safe, but we've got to also think about that smaller proportion that don't and why don't they feel safe. And actually, there's often wider things going on. It might be preventing them. They might be feeling unsafe, but then that might be stopping them accessing an after school club or, or, or an evening activity and the kinds of things that we want young people engaging with. Certainly my, my, my kids, I want them out doing things, not sat at home on computers and, and, and sort of bored and, and, and not being active. So we've also got to think about the other, the other knock-on effects that some of this has in terms of preventing access um, to different services and different, different opportunities around the borough. Um, I recognise the points made about some of our existing stock, some of the existing issues. Um, it's always helpful when those are reported in to us and, and, and we've been meeting more regularly as well with our cabinet member, Councillor Phil Hazer, 
um, who's sitting in the public gallery tonight around how we can speed up the efficiency of those fixes. There's lots of competing issues there, um, but my colleagues might want to sort of build on on that a little, a little bit further in terms of how we can be better at fixing things when, when they go wrong. Um, I recognise that things don't get done as quick as they, they probably should do at times. Um, we've got a programme of LED uh, upgrade um, of, our, of our lighting stock. Again, that's something we can look at and think about some of these hotspot areas and issues um, to perhaps uh, get, get LEDs in there. That gives us better controls. It helps with some of those sustainability and economic issues that, that, that I mentioned as well. Uh, I mean, we've seen... Um, some really good successes with, with changing lighting levels. So Goswell Hill and, and the Thames Valley Police um, presentation earlier this evening sort of made me think about that, where we've increased the lux and increased the, the burn, if you like, on the LEDs and the lighting there at, at the bottom of Goswell Hill, where all the nightclubs are, to make sure that's very well lit when the nightclubs are turning people out. And it's it's helping us to, uh, it's a bit like the rain scenario. It, it help, you know, th those very lit areas when people are getting into cabs and things, helps them to get on with what they need to do and stop them sort of getting involved in other, other sorts of activity that we'd prefer them not to be doing um, at that time of night and get them home. Um, and I think just sort of to try and conclude in terms of what I'm saying, and then colleagues, if the chair allows, might, might, might want to add anything I, I've missed, but we've got lots of of intelligence here we've got your intelligence and what you presented in the report we've got what the team hold in terms of areas of different lighting mixes and solutions that are in place we've got andy's information which very much sits alongside the thames valley police piece in terms of crime and antisocial behavior and and problems hotspot areas and we just need to be better at how we overlay this information to really then hone in on what are those particular areas that need attention. Um, it's not to say that perceptions are wrong, but often perceptions can be different to reality with all things. And, and that's not suggesting any of your perceptions are wrong at all, but it's just making sure that where we do prioritise, we prioritise for the right reasons, backed by intelligence and information that we can, we can rely on as well. Um, so I think it's ultimately working with you more, but more effectively. So I, I hear what you're saying about we've, we've done a lot of talking, we've had a lot of conversations, but what has that amounted to? So again, it might, it might feature as part of the motion, but it's how do we make that tangible, but effective how we work with you through some of these problems that you've, that you've, um, that you've highlighted tonight. But thanks once again. If chair's happy, there might be comments that some of my team want to, to add, but I'll leave that to the chair because of time. Thank you. Yes, because of time, first of all, I'm going to announce that we're going to have a short comfort break. During this time, the clerk will speak to you about what is actually going to happen next, okay? And then I'll also discuss with the officers here, right, the proper way forward. We've had two mentions of task and finish group, and we've also had a mention about a motion. He will explain those to you, and you're welcome to stay, but again, I'm very conscious about, you know, your, your presence here at this time. So for five minutes, we're going to have a quick comfort break.
we yeah. Thank you again. Um, we're back online, councillors, and uh, it's now 9.21 after a brief break. Um, the situation has been discussed between the uh, Youth Council and my learned clerk, as I like to call them. And, <laughs> the, and to bring you up to date is the next ONS meeting is on the 12th of April, is booked. Now, that is in the expression of Perda. But however, I'm hoping that the officers can return with a qualitative report on that time, right, at that time, and answer and give you the opportunity to digest that as well, probably beforehand as well as that, and draw your comments from it as well, and your understanding of what the technical and practical ways are going forward. Is that okay, Andrew? We, we, we just, we just, we might have heard that um, one of the youth council mentioned about being away at that time. Did you say? Are you? Is there any suggestion that you're not available at those dates? Sorry. No. You know, twelfth of April. Are you available on the twelfth of April? Um, well, we haven't looked into. <laughs> no. What we're, we're just saying is that we obviously we have school and stuff so we have may i suggest you have a look at your diaries and your examination dates etc <laughs> and your holiday and travel arrangements and if there's any substitutes that or more that want to come along they're more than welcome okay we that's the best way we can resolve this do councillors agree that no, because no, a motion is not necessary we'll get What was discussed? Oren, can you give, put clarity on that? Yes, so, and Andrew, if you want to come in at any point for this. So with the Youth Council, we discussed that basically Holly and Alexander feel that because they represent a whole group of youth councillors and they are not currently here tonight, they're not prepared to necessarily support any motion without the backing of the full Youth Council. So when speaking with Andrew and Elise, we've decided with Holly and Alexander that this is potentially the um, best way forward to bring it back in a couple of months time and let the officers go away and do the work and bring back their findings. Do what work? So I, th I think what it will be is a review. It's, it, I suppose it, it, it's a response to the issues that Youth Council members have, have put forwards to us. It will involve some joint working with both Alexander, Holly, and maybe your, some of your colleagues as well, um, to, to hone in on those particular areas that, that, that they've identified. I mean, there's the broader piece around you know, fixing current issues out there, which I think the team will come back with a, with a better update to, to panel members so you can clearly see the map of issues and, and, and what we're doing um, to, to, to resolve those but then specifically what we're going to do in and around those areas that have been identified by the Youth Council. It might be a set of options or potential solutions. There might not just be one thing um, that, that comes, comes out of those. As we said, each location is a bit different and needs maybe a different approach. But it's to, yeah, it's to, it's to go away, do some joint working with the Youth Council to return back to Overview and Scrutiny Committee, probably that, that April date, uh, 12th, did we say? And uh, provide a report back to committee to, um, to detail all of those things I've, I've just said, essentially, about our response to the issues raised by the Youth Council on this, uh, on this matter. Something along those lines, I'll yes. say, Chair. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Regarding what's the current state of fixing and um, that sort of yes. and power, yeah, yeah. And power supplies. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Councillor Luxton. Thank you, Jeff. I understand what you're saying that you will come back to us, but will you liaise with the councillors in that ward where the problems are? They did not, spe they did not specifically say about the charter school and that area where the crime scenes have happened and that is quite serious because that has been recorded in the police station about one for sure and i know one person within the council has recorded has found one knife so i just wondered if 
this is going to be taken any further or is just seriously. So I would like to be involved as a councillor for Sunningdale to find out what is up there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Singh, briefly and quickly. Yeah, hello, I'm happy with, happy with the recommendation, but my only concern is that uh, it's a ten, this is a very serious issue and, and to come back in 10 weeks time, uh, it seems a very long time away. Um, and if, if it can be uh, brought back sooner, uh, before PERDA, that would be very helpful. So we, we can uh, relay the message to the residents and let them know what, what action has been taken. That's up to the Democratic Services to rearrange any possible dates in due course. Yeah, but if you could put the recommendation forward, you know, on behalf of the panel, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Noted. Thank you. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, councillors, youth councillors, thank you very much for your attendance. I do apologise for the lack of formalities on hold on my fingers being pointed that I've still got another matter to deal with. Don't all race away. I can allow at least go, yes. <laughs> um, it's the work, work program for the next meeting. Um, if you want to go ahead, because that's going to be, yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. So panel, just very quickly. Um, currently, we have the 12th of April, as you've heard, the Youth Council report will hopefully be coming back. Um, we also have a resident scrutiny topic on bin collections, which is currently with Elise and Andrew and her team. Um, so hopefully we might be able to get that one onto that meeting as well. Um, and then obviously we're holding it for any in-depth performance reports if referred to by corporate ONS. Um, if I draw your attention to the bottom of the document, on page 17, there's a few scoping documents which do need to be addressed. Um, the SIL scoping document is still outstanding and has been for quite a while. Um, it's stagnated somewhat due to a change in panel membership recently. Um, we can sort this offline, but a panel member will need, to, if we want to take that scoping document forward, well, we need to be nominated to continue with that. Um, review of street lighting, of course, we've just discussed now, and then the River Thames scheme as well, which is with the chairman. Can I just ask, the River Thames scheme, is that the one within the borough or is it the global one that goes all the way down to Staines? What, within the larger one? Yeah. Yeah. Or well, what's left? Because I had some difficulty with that as to um, whether we could um, get get it all fixed in that. Okay, I'll come back to you with that about the River Thames scheme. Councillor. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, that community infrastructure levy uh, review has been outstanding for quite some time now. And I was just going to ask it because there's no panel member allocated to do carry out that piece of work. Uh, is it possible you could um, take it upon yourself as chairman uh, to liaise with Chris Joyce and see if we can bring that uh, agenda item forward for review? Because uh, my concern is it's, it's going to be missed off again and it's going to result in the borough losing millions of pounds through missed seal money. What it refers to is that there is a scoping document that has not been produced for this topic. So any councillor can do that. Sorry, Chair, just to clarify, the scoping document has been produced by a councillor who's not long, no longer on this panel. So to take it forward, we will need another panel member to take over that scoping document, which is somewhat completed, but this was maybe September. I haven't seen it since. Um, so further things need to be taken into account to complete the scoping document to bring it to panel. I mean, if, if, if nobody else wants to do it, I'm happy to um, liaise with yourself or Anne and, and get that uh, process moving and get that brought forward if, uh, if everyone's happy for me to do it, panel members. No, I think that's just yeah. Um, I think um, about the document. If you would like to take over and complete the scope and document, not liaise with the officers and directly yeah. take it forward. 
<coughs> it's red tape wrapped around them documents. You, 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 you need, you need, it's a you will get the support of the democratic democratic services in compiling the scoping document, and then it, there is a decision whether it comes after the decision whether it is submitted from there. A lot of the scoping document has already been completed. It has been attached in previous agendas, maybe even back in June, it was attached to the agenda. And um, obviously it's now January. I'm more than happy to offline put you in contact with Mr. Mark Beely, who's our statutory scrutiny officer. And he can work with you to fill out the scope, rest of the scoping document to bring it back to panel. I'm happy if uh, the panel's uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. happy to delegate authority to me on that one. That's it. It's over to you, Councillor. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Right. The meeting is now finished. Thank you all for your services.